Avril ran by him and down the tail of the Brachiosaurus. My sword! She retrieved her fallen weapon from the grass and scabbarded it. Then, clambering back up onto the dinosaur's back, said, I'm Lady Avril Louisette. Lady, you say? The dinosaur tamer raised fine brown eyebrows. Of what country? England? France? Scotland? Cythera. Cythera. He seemed unsurprised. You've been to one of the six realms? Quite recently. Unusual for a mortal to have already been to a realm and then return to the Shadowlands. I was under the impression that travelers could not re-enter the Shadowlands once they left. I'm no mortal. I'm an elf. Avril enlightened him. Under her, the Brachiosaurus glided across the thickness of the jungle with ease. I'm Robert Louis Stevenson. He shook her hand. The Robert Louis Stevenson? The author of Treasure Island? Yes, I did write that. What are you doing stuck in the Shadowlands? Mortis Capers. What? Not a what? A who? <laughs> Mortis Capers controls who departs from the Shadowlands, and he is not an easy man to please. <laughs> I just... I saw that page and I was like, okay, so this has stupid names, weird world building, dinosaurs, <laughs> real life dead people. It was really like a Prime Minister Blair moment. It's perfect. It has the same energy as like, here's a real person in this nonsense story. Hello and welcome to another meeting of the SBU English Club. I am your host, Andrew. Brave tarnished. Whispers of Lauren M. Davis yet linger here. Wouldst thou stay with me and hear them? If I say yes, is it going to just burn down the entire world? It might. <laughs> or am I going to wake up in a stupid dungeon with a bunch of dragons flying around and people wielding M16s? Probably the second one, but I'll never tell. <laughs> Oh boy, am I excited for today's meeting. Like our surprise guest mentioned, we have a new member, Lauren M. Davis, who has asked to share her novel-length work, Nova's Playlist from Cinders to Tiara. Quite the mouthful of a title, if I do say so myself. I think there's actually a third part. It's Nova's Playlist from Cinders to Tiara, Princesses of Earth number one. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's Nova's Playlist from Cinders to Tiara, Princesses of Earth number one. It's got a heading, a subheading, and a sub-subheading. The taxonomy of this book is immaculate. This has been such an interesting thing to read. I'm so excited to share it with you guys and Lauren to share with you some advice and some input on how you have executed this amazing vision that you've had. Um, this is like completely honestly a book that I have wanted so badly to tackle. I basically forced Jay to speed read it at gunpoint just so we could be one of the first people to talk about this. This is going to be a, a doozy of an episode. This is the fastest I've ever read a book for this show. Um, usually it takes anywhere between a week and longer than a week, and this took me like two and a half days. Yeah. I was, I was caught in between not wanting to read it too fast because then I wouldn't pick up on what was happening, but I knew that if we waited even a few days between finishing the book and recording it that I would no longer remember everything that had happened because there's so much. <laughs> so like we had to hit this like perfect sweet spot where it's like we finish reading it and then we record it immediately while it's all still in the chamber. Like <laughs> unbelievable. The amount of content in this book. Yeah, literally unbelievable. I fully expect to be here for the rest of the night. If you know anything about Lauren M. Davis, you are probably a TikTok or a Twitter person. If I am getting this wrong, forgive me for my bad SEO, but I have not been able to find a lot of content outside of those platforms about this book. So that was another reason I really wanted to get this out there so that we could add a little bit of positivity to the narrative, uh, or at least constructiveness. 
Yeah, and like outside of a lot of drama posting, there's very few TikToks or tweets analyzing the actual contents of the book. There's at least one pretty notable one that several people shared with me. So I'm sure that people who are listening to this right now have heard or seen that one. Mm-hmm. But um, today we're going to dive a little deeper into the the contents and the scope of this novel. Yes, usually we try to leave the author out of our episodes as much as possible. Uh, I personally... When I'm doing critique, I don't like the biographical lens. I think it's kind of reductive. We are going back on that rule for this case. Uh, It's kind of unavoidable just because of the way that the drama permeates the text of the novel. We will be discussing hashtag Sungate, hashtag Lauren M. Davis controversy. But keep in mind that this is a book-centric podcast, so if you're here for the drama, all we ask is you just stick around until the very end. Yeah, we're gonna do the whole book before we talk about the drama, um, insofar as as possible. Right. Lauren might pop in here and there, but we're gonna we're gonna talk about all the the stuff that happened towards the end. Right. So yeah, I think this is still a good group to talk about this book because we are dealing with a group of people who are very well versed in controversial outsider art with uh interesting world building see a critique group is all about who you surround yourself with and it doesn't matter necessarily how many people or even how good of a writer they are it matters what niche they have what interests they have and what they can offer you as a critique partner did i ever say who i was by the way yeah you're the little goblin no i'm not the no i was so you might have been confused because I was doing Melina from Elden Ring. My oh. impression was so impeccable that you might have um, not even realized that it was me, Jay, here. <laughs> but um, that that was actually really clever foreshadowing because um, this book is all about video games. Yes. And fittingly, this book feels like something of like a DPS check, but for <laughs> our podcast. Like this is going to test every tool in our literary arsenal. <laughs> We're going to need to talk about character arcs, we're going to need to talk about love triangles, we're going to need to talk about world building, we're going to need to talk about editing, revision, being in a community of writers. I don't think there's anything that we learned in our undergrad and or grad programs that we're not going to talk about today. No, this is kind of our final boss. I think we did some bit in the, um, I think it was the Rin, Tongue, and Dorner episode about that being the end of season one, but I think that was like a fake out. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is like, this is like the second health bar yeah. of, of Rin, Tongue, and Dorner. Oh my god, it really is. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, If you are new to this show, we are the SBU English Club podcast, the best critique group that nobody asked for. We are real critique partners from a fake university, and our goal is to shine a constructive light on controversial, bad, and or mid books that are famous on the internet. We don't always succeed, but we always give it the old SBU try. Yeah, the most important thing is that we give the writers who submitted their books in writing explicitly asking for our feedback, we give them good constructive feedback that if they were to revise, they could actually use. Right. Uh, we're not just here to uh, shut all over books that everybody already agrees are no good. So uh, be ready to get into it. Oh, yeah. Strap in. This is going to be a fun one. Let's get into our summary of what was it called? Nova's Playlist from Cinders to Tiara. Solar Sisters 1? What was it? Princesses of Earth number one. Princesses of Earth number one. Solar Sisters was the AU fiction posted to um, help her legal case. But we'll get to that at the end of the video. So I've got to be honest with you. I was following for most of this book. But right around page 330 or so, I was starting to feel a little bit groggy. So I would very much appreciate it if you took the lead on the summary for this one. And I will assist as much as possible. (laughs) Um, But I was having a little bit of trouble keeping track of all of the disparate plot threads. Oh, Jay, don't you worry. As the foremost Novus Playlist scholar, I have devised my own taxonomy for working with the corpus of this book. I did this because there was an annoying tendency of Lauren to have half of one story arc in one chapter and then finish it up in half of another. So it kind of incremented by halves. I've just grouped them into their thematic through lines. 
And looking at this document you sent over, it looks like your structure for this novel's plot has 14 discrete parts. Is that right? Versus 18 chapters. Buckle up. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So Nova's playlist is what could probably be best defined as a picaresque double frame narrative speculative fiction novel really is that the best way okay so there are two (laughs) levels of frame story the entire plot is defined by little disparate adventures that the main character has and it is a novel so i have no other words to describe it i would argue that it is actually one and two halves frame stories wait 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 one and two halves frame story is just a two frame story Mm, no it's like one and then two halves of different frame stories whatever whatever okay one and two halves or two if you want to do math correctly talk about frame story arc one the prologue so nova our in-universe narrator describes herself writing the story of Lydia Trace, intern of some nebulous corporation, stepping into a virtual reality room and starting to play the game Time Visitor. Conceptually, I do think this is kind of the right way to do prologues because the reader is going to ascertain that the events to come are part of the simulation if they, you know, remember. If indeed Lydia herself remembers right. that she's in a simulation. Because Lydia goes through a lot. <laughs> Despite the conceit that is being established here of this all being a simulation, we should probably keep critiquing this as if the events were quote unquote real in the realm of the story, both because they, spoiler alert, are, and because I think it's more fun that way. Do you agree? I agree, because if we were to not do that, then essentially the concession we would be making is that well, it's a video game, so it doesn't have to make sense. Right. At which point, there's no point in reading it at all, because if it's allowed to not be internally consistent, then it's not interesting fiction. Yeah. So I think we should treat the story of the virtual reality simulation as a story. Arc 2, Avril's Life in France. So we begin our real story close on Thomas Quint, a man who does not matter paying a surprise visit to his niece, our hero, Avril Louisette in Calais, France. It's the late 1700s, I think 1788, is that right? That sounds right. Okay. Uh, Avril is a 17-year-old, like, handmaiden, personal servant, maid type thing, and also a hobbyist actor. She lives with her parents, Martha and Brett, in some nebulous poverty, even though Thomas apparently owns a manor. Whatever. Don't worry about that. Okay, I won't. Yeah, don't. Avril goes to her job, and she is serving a girl named Priscilla Notley, who, despite her name, wasn't really that mean to her. Despite being told that Priscilla is very spoiled over and over, I I don't remember too many, like, overtly mean segments from her. One thing she does do is, like, demand that Avril attend the ball with her. Which is kind of a favor in a way. Hadn't Avril like a chapter earlier said that she wanted to go out? Oh yeah. Avril gets to go to this party that Priscilla got invited to, to the Chevalier family's manor at Infinite Glen Circle. Whatever that means, I'm assuming it's called Infinite Glen Circle because it's like a really big manor and comprises a bunch of different addresses and it's like a joke or something i think it's like the name of the manor like they're so rich their house has a name but i think it's just a confusing and anachronistic name Uh, i don't know i don't know what's going on there i don't think they had street addresses in 1788 rural france they didn't have a lot of thing in 1788 rural france that lauren m davis says that there is so shut up (laughs) She goes to this party, she meets a carousel of characters, the creepy Lord Fortis, Rebecca Fairchild, and Chipper Dubois, which I thought was a really funny name, as well as the dark and mysterious Vincent Chevalier, the scion of the household. He doesn't really talk to a lot of people, he's kind of like a sigma... They think he's like a vampire or something. It's really weird. They're like, do you v- think he could v- v- be of a vampire? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. 
Vincent shows up because Avril's there and she's the main character and she's apparently like unfathomably beautiful. She and Vincent flirt a bit. And he saves her from bandits after this party. Uh, He saves her from falling at another party. And all the while, he's like telling her to stay away from him because he's dangerous and mysterious. But he approaches her invariably in, in every single scene. Every single time he engages. He is the one that initiates. And then he's like, no. You mustn't. Stay away. I'm so dangerous. <laughs> it's so <laughs> terrible. It's, it's really bad. Listen, listen, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, Zayden Ryerson would never, okay? That man has too much respect for himself. <laughs> no, this made me respect Zayden Ryerson so much more. <laughs> I was actually looking back at like previous love interests and I was like, I think this might be the worst one. <laughs> this might be. So all the men love Avril. Like I mentioned, she's beautiful. And this makes Vincent, like, noticeably jealous, but in a sexy kind of way. Like, I think someone describes Vincent as looking at her like someone had stolen his favorite pony, which I thought was kind of an interesting analogy. No, that's that's totally normal. That's fine. Yep. So Avril hears some mysterious conversations about the six realms and all of this magic stuff, but Vincent plays coy about it. There's actually something that I really liked there when... She overhears some people talking about the Herculean Mountains and the Six Realms, because as like a a peasant girl from 1700s France, they mentioned the Herculean Mountains and she's like, I've never heard of that, but I don't, I don't know. I haven't been a lot of places. Like maybe that's real. Um, And that was a moment where I thought that was a good bit of a dramatic irony almost, because like we as the readers know that like that's not a real geographic place. So it's a good indication that like something supernatural or magical or i don't know some sort of secondary world element is about to be introduced but from avril's perspective i felt like her reaction was really organic um in that she's like i'm just a girl <laughs> like right. i don't know yeah. no i actually never thought about that that's really good world building even yeah it was really effective i wished that, th- that there had been more of that as it went on um it did make me wonder why lydia is reacting this way as avril since we know that lydia is playing this game but that I could say that about literally everything Avril does, so I won't keep saying it. I'll just say it now since this is the first time. And I don't want to belabor a spoiler, but ostensibly all of this did really happen, and this is a simulation of real-life events. So maybe there's some extra influence from that regard. I don't know. I don't know. And then in one of these flirting scenes, she invites him to her performance at the theater. They're doing some weird play. I have no idea. I think it's like the, the myth of Persephone question mark yeah so then they're doing that ballet it's based on the hades and persephone myth i think like you said mm-hmm. which i thought could potentially be read as like pretty interesting foreshadowing Ooh. um in that she later has to escape death mm-hmm. and also the king of the underworld which is persephone like right it, it's it's tenuous but there's there's similar elements i don't know if it's just an unintentional echo but you could definitely read it as foreshadowing no yeah you definitely could uh, that's really interesting good job lauren you did it you did a writing you did one writing so yeah this kind of passes without event but at the cast party afterwards there is another actor in the play who is very very specifically mentioned to be arabian quote unquote despite his name being william sage and we can talk about the um, etymological implications of that all day, but he is William Sage and he is Arabian. Lauren Davis wants you to know this. He makes an unwelcome pass at Avril, and this allows Vincent to save her once again. Uh, this is kind of a foreshadowing of um, many, many very uncomfortable things to come yeah uh this book really wants you to know when a character is not white yes 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 okay that's a very good way to put it um it goes out of its way to call out non-whiteness yeah to ends that i believe are inappropriate yeah i think that's a good way of putting it i don't want to accuse lauren m davis of like any kind of um malintent but the only character who is white who introduces herself by her nationality is avril Mm -hmm. when she is called upon to say that she's from france right however the narration itself 
makes it abundantly clear every time a character is of a non-white racial or ethnic group yes oh my god it's really bad okay um well skipping past that for right now because it'll come back um avril goes to church and the vicar talks about john 316 because of course that that might be the only bible verse that lauren davis knows i don't know i doubt it from her twitter thread i doubt it i'm not saying that to comment on lauren's intelligence what i mean is that the sermon that follows for what it's worth is deeply deeply heretical talking about uh possible other gods and other sons of god existing yeah and magic worlds yeah it's a it's like henotheistic like it's like willing to admit that there are other gods but that the Christian God is the only one you should worship. Right. I was so fascinated by this scene for reasons that are not at all beneficial to the narrative, but the way that the sermon is delivered is so blatantly like American evangelical and Protestant yes. in a country that should be Catholic, like extremely Catholic. Protestants weren't even allowed citizenship in France in the 1700s. So this is insane that he's saying this. Yeah. yeah. Also, I think it's worth noting that like, the the henotheism is something that actually like some people in my church growing up like acknowledge really that in the bible it does talk about like don't swear fealty to other gods so the implication is that there are other gods to swear fealty to oh. so like it just seems like a natural step to be like yeah maybe zeus is real but uh don't worship him huh so i thought that was interesting that there were other christians out there who had that same viewpoint because it's not something I, I had encountered a lot as a kid or since. Well, I'll add that to the list of future crusades. Uh, good on you, 1700s France Vicar of a rural uh, church. <laughs> okay. Yeah, whatever. It's, it's, it's one and done. Avril participates in a ladies auxiliary benefit bake sale. And I don't even want to go back into the anachronism stuff, but I don't think that was a real thing. Speaking of things you do after an American evangelical church service. <laughs> a, a Baptist church service. Anyways, uh, some sailors show up and buy her entire stock. Uh, Sh Avril ends up helping them load up. And in boarding the ship, she gets locked in a closet and literally kidnapped by Vincent, who just so happens to be the captain of the ship. He's the captain of the ship, and he opens the, the closet door on her when they're already out at sea. And he's like, I can't take you back to the shore because it's my turn to do patrols and we're going to be out here for a fortnight. And at that point, I was like, what do you mean it's your turn? Do the sons of noble lords take turns personally captaining patrol ships in this universe? This does not make sense. No, it, and it's just like, it is both literally and acknowledged to be kidnapping Avril. So not a lot of points in Vincent's favor right now, but he does give her earrings and this actually does end up mattering. So I don't mention it for no reason. Avril joins Vincent for dinner on the ship because she has no other choice. She has been kidnapped. And they're also there with a quote unquote merchant who reveals that he intends to join the transatlantic slave trade and use Vincent's money and somehow profit him from this. So Vincent refuses, points back to him, I suppose. And the merchant kidnaps Avril and Vincent's best friend slash bodyguard, Cirrus, and throws them on his slave ship bound for New Orleans. And we're about to reveal some things about Vincent in a little bit that will make you look back on this moment and go, why did he allow this to occur? Yes. And that will never be answered. No. So, um... Yeah, just sort of sit with that. Sit with that, and also sit with the fact that Cirrus and Avril are both explicitly white, but the racial implications of them being thrown into a slave ship are never even touched upon. And the slaves on the ship are not given any page time either. No. They are less than set dressing. I don't even think that they're mentioned more than maybe twice. They almost certainly aren't. And if they are, it is only in very alien, creepy, and dehumanizing ways. Yeah, because then we skip right over the entire voyage of the ship to the Americas. And we are, what, at the slave market? in new orleans and avril is being sold yes in arc number three the new orleans arc 
like Jay mentioned, Avril is being auctioned off. The auctioneer calls her up to the stands and struggles to come up with uh, selling points for Avril. So Avril curtsies and lists off her employable skills in a scene so bizarre that it loops back up the horseshoe and jumps over into gallows humor. My jaw was on the floor. She literally sells herself. Literally. Not literally as in figuratively. She actually gets up there and because the like Barker can't think of anything to say, she sells herself. It's ridiculous. It It is disgusting. It is mean-spirited. It is insensitive. And all of that just comes back to the worst or or best shock humor I could ever imagine. We should also toss in there while we're talking about this scene. Mm -hmm. If you saw that TikTok, this is also the same scene where while she's on the like stand or block or whatever, there's an enslaved man being sold like next to her and he like flirts with her. Yes. While they're being sold. Creepily. I don't want to say anything else about that, but it does happen because it doesn't matter. So we'll just move on. But it happens. Cirrus, um, who is uh, Vincent's little bodyguard slash friend and Avril both happen to be bought by the same household, that of the Spanish military treasurer Don Vincente Jose Nunez. (sighs) So while being carted off, Avril doesn't think about her family, her friends, all the other enslaved people that she was just in a boat with for weeks, presumably, or the fact that Vincent kidnapped her and did nothing to stop her from being sold into slavery. She is just annoyed and mildly disappointed that she didn't get a cooler slave job because they're going to make her work in, like, housekeeping or something yeah she's mad that she didn't have like upward career mobility from her position in france she's gonna be doing the same thing essentially right uh so avril inexplicably can speak both english and spanish despite being french uh there's a little banquet scene and nunez calls over avril and creeps on her only to bite her wrist and drink her blood like he's a vampire or something I, i don't know um Avril tries to resist. There's a fight. A fire starts. Do you remember how the fire starts? Because I don't. No, I never was clear on that. Okay, a fire starts. And Cirrus hears her cries and rescues her by flying away with wings that I quote, this is Lauren Davis saying, not me, um, are bright, colorful, and the wingtips looked almost tribal. I forgot about that. No, he does not belong to a non-racist fantasy tribe that uses bright colors. We are just supposed to intrinsically understand as readers that tribal means a single unified colorful style. Yeah, I think that that use of the word tribal is kind of fascinating from like a cultural anthropology perspective Mm -hmm. in that the choice to use that word as opposed to colorful, the choice to invoke like its associations feels so deliberate and like it tells us something i don't know exactly what right about something some like the way lauren thinks of words like i i don't know we could get into a discussion about like public and private definitions of words but i think it means something different to her than it means in like the public consciousness because again i don't think she's trying to be racist no i i think she just but that is the that that is the effect <laughs> oh yes no she is being racist i don't think she is intending to i really mulled over that passage for a long time but we will move on as the fire rages and threatens the city of new orleans cirrus lands in a quote unquote building full of nuns to treat avril's wounds uh, vincent is there and is so unceremoniously described that I thought Lauren got confused between him and Cirrus, but it is Vincent. He was there waiting for them, I guess. It is revealed while the nuns are treating her wounds that Avril has uh, silver blood, which she didn't even know. Yeah, because she had never had cause to bleed. (laughs) Yes, she said, I've never had a reason to bleed. (laughs) Keep in mind, dear listener... She is an active lifestyle 17 year old girl. If we really have to get into it, this is completely inconceivable and ridiculous. She's a handmaiden in a French manner. Like, 
She sews, she knits, probably, she cuts food, she dances, surely she's fallen and scraped her palms, like... Anything! But no, she's so metal, she's like, I have never had a reason to bleed. <laughs> she's not... <laughs> oh my god, I can't get over it, I can't get over it. Um, whatever. So, this revelation, accompanied with the fact that Nunez apparently can track Avril, brings Vincent to desperate measures... And he teleports her by means of a fairy door to dot 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 arc number four Scythera. Is that how you say it? Do you say Scythera? What did I say earlier? I think I said Scythera. I think you said Scythera earlier because it bothered me so much because like I say Scytheria as like the um, alternate name of um, Venus or whatever, but maybe it is Scytheria. But it is Scythera here. So this is just like a bastardized version of that word. Yeah, I guess so. Oh, I didn't even make that connection. I don't I don't think they're supposed to be the same. I mean, what else could it be? I think it's just she was making a fantasy sounding words. Okay, uh, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt. But this is clearly just another word for Venus with the letter dropped off. We are now in the celestial realm of Scythera, which is apparently like Vincent and Cirrus's homeworld. And Avril stumbles into the court of King Eli, who is revealed to be Vincent and Rebecca, who was like a minor character introduced in the parties in France. He's their father. I'm going to break down the cosmology of this world once we've gotten a little bit further along. I've encountered more elements of it. But this is effectively heaven. Right. Yeah. This is where you go when you get out of purgatory question mark yeah they have they have a hell yeah the shadowlands right which is also kind of like purgatory and then if you get out of there or i think you can come straight here if you're like good or something this is where you go and this world scythera and it's like five neighboring realms are going to be kind of the main setting yes on and off yes very on and off like the intermediate setting avril is recognized as an outsider by virtue of her heartbeat and rather than explain anything about what happened to get her there or who she is, Avril mouths off to the king and promptly gets arrested. And he says he says he's going to kill her, yeah. which will send her to the Shadow Realms. Right. So if you're alive <laughs> in heaven and then you die, you go to hell. I guess that makes sense. But in what circumstance would you be alive in heaven? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, angels do end up dying in this story, so we'll get to it. Um. So Vincent appears once again unceremoniously, and and by unceremoniously, uh, this is kind of a book-wide comment, but a scene will be proceeding along, and two characters are talking, and then a third character will suddenly, sometimes even magically, appear and then start talking. This really made me realize how much I take, um, I call them reaction shots for granted, so when someone or something magically appears or suddenly happens, there's usually a break in the action to say, oh, Avril jumped, not having noticed that Vincent was there, or even Vincent appeared, period, the rest of the scene. This never happens. Characters always just are dropped into the scene and proceed as if nothing had happened. And it made me reread so many stupid paragraphs. It bothered me so much. I don't know if you noticed that, Jay. Oh, I absolutely did. It's like in a movie, if if there was like a typical shot reverse shot construction for a conversation mm -hmm. with just two people in it. And then suddenly they did a reverse shot and there was like another person there yes. and no one reacted to it. <laughs> right. It's like, it's like. Not even like for comedy so that the characters can both jump and be like, oh, where'd you come from? It's like if they just did the reverse shot and there's just another person and then the conversation continued. Yeah. So, yeah. So that happens with Vincent in this um, arrest scene. He vouches for Avril and gets her a job as the protege Reed handmaiden of a noblewoman, Diana Cade. All I can remember about her is she's kind of dismissive of Avril's desire to go home. But that desire isn't very strong in Avril, so it kind of petered out. This is one of the first times that Avril expresses a actual, like, desire, like a goal. Yes. Typically, characters have those, especially main characters. Typically. Uh, they have multiple, often, and they're sort of nuanced and complicated. And it's not usually like, I want to get the amulet. It's like, I want to get the amulet so that I can blah, 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 blah. But then there's complicating factors. Right. She just suddenly is Dorothy and she's like, I just want to go home. Right. And th this did not happen when she was enslaved. 
this just happened when she was in the court. When she was enslaved, she was like, how am I going to pay the bills in America where I live now, (laughs) I guess? (laughs) She immediately accepted it. It's so weird. It's so weird. Um, So yeah, there's some court intrigue. There's rumors of a traitor lurking in the palace or wherever the hell they are. Mm, A traitor, you say? Avril experiences visions of Nunez. Apparently he's like marked her and definitely isn't a vampire, but at this point they only think he's some kind of demon. Okay, sure. I don't know why he can't just be a vampire, but points for originality. Cirrus is charged to protect her, sort of like Liam from Fourth Wing style. He kind of comes and goes very intermittently. Avril learns ballroom dancing, piano lessons, horseback riding from this guy, and his name is Nicholas Snicket. Uh, really? This is important. This is important? Nicholas Snicket is important for my breakdown of the cosmology. I, we, need to, we need to dwell with him for just a moment so that I don't have to uh, come back to explain him from the beginning later. Okay. Um, Nicholas Snicket is, is important and interesting, I think, because he is a man that died and went to heaven. Yes. And when he got to heaven, God said, okay, in life, you were a music teacher, you were a horseback riding teacher. Now that you're in heaven, your job is going to be still doing that forever (laughs) for the rest of eternity for my family and their servants so the implication is that when you go to heaven it's life but more and forever and it's the same (laughs) yeah what if you're like a really talented plumber and you hated your life but you were really good at it (laughs) yeah then you go to heaven and you're a plumber forever and here's the kicker avril is being trained to better serve diana whatever her name is yeah and She's getting paid to do that. Like, she's getting a salary so that she can have an apartment. Not only do you go to heaven and continue doing what you did on Earth forever, but, like, you're back in a system of, like, commerce. Yes. Yes, you're back in capitalism. The implication is that, like, if you then didn't have a job and didn't get paid, you wouldn't be able to, like, live. Says a lot about the author's worldview, right? This is really, like, an as above, so below moment. Like, the magician tarot card is, like, it's coming out in full force. It's really (laughs) saying that, like, Earth mirrors heaven and heaven mirrors Earth, and it's impossible to say which one came first. They're, like, dark reflections of each other. Ooh. Really interesting questions you're raising, Lauren. It's terrifying. This is a sleeper horror novel. I'll say more later about how grim this is, but I, I just wanted to sit with Nicholas Snicket for a second and talk about, like, he's lucky because he likes what he does. Right, but, but what if you didn't? If you didn't and you were good at it, too f***ing bad. <laughs> right? So, yeah, Rebecca teaches her how to sword fight. Rebecca is Vincent's sister, apparently. I want to dwell on, like, some of the world building just for a second, and th- this is not something, like, Jay is going to say that's, like, intelligent or important. This is something that really only bothered me. I, I dog-eared this passage, and I'm going to read it really quickly, if you'll pardon me. Is he a dead mortal like Nicholas too? Avril asked. We call them transcenders, yes. Transcender? As in conqueror? Of what? Death? So... No definition of transcend implies conquering, and it really bothers me that this is said and then taken for granted. I guess it boils down to a pet peeve, but I I couldn't stop thinking about that. Hey, a transcender, I I hardly know her. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I realize that's kind of a really minor point, but I just, come on, Lauren. (laughs) No, it is weird. I mean, transcend, like, it means, like, I guess, like, to to go above like in the loosest sense but surpass yeah this transcends the genre of speculative fiction this doesn't conquer the genre the genre is not now supplicant to Mm. nova's playlist agree to disagree (laughs) okay whatever everything that comes after this will bear its fingerprints (laughs) (laughs) if we have anything to do about it The earrings that Avril got in France are magic charms that allow you to speak any language seamlessly. Uh, I actually think that's kind of cool. It's a neat little MacGuffin, and it smooths over a lot of things that would be very annoying in a picaresque narrative like we're going to get into. It's nice that they're on the ears, too. That that makes a good associative sense. Sure. Yeah. Easy. But the earrings are ancient talismans from ancient Babylonia, which is stupid. We learn that the silver blood and her oddly tipped ears mean that Avril is actually an elf. So she has to learn to control her elf magic. Oh, Andrew, 
I, I know about elf magic. Do you? It's like purely based on spoken speech, correct? Correct. They probably speak like a really magical language, like, I don't know, Elven or maybe even Latin or something. Oh, no, they speak the most magical, mysterious language of all. Japanese. Nani? <laughs> um, so yeah, Lauren has opted for a Harry Potter-esque just say the magic word right enough and your powers work magic system which is not bad intrinsically magic systems can get very stupid very fast so having a simple one seems like a good idea but whereas harry potter used like bastardized latin words lauren uses just the direct japanese translation of whatever she wants to happen yeah so if you're wondering right now uh dear listener Okay, so are there more elves, and are all elves Japanese, and if they're Japanese, how is Avril from France, and if the elves aren't Japanese, then why is Japanese the magic language, and if Japanese is the magic language, then do all Japanese people have access to magic? The answers are no, I don't know, I don't remember the rest of the questions that I asked, (laughs) but essentially, you have to be an elf and speaking the Japanese correctly for the magic to work. Right. There are no other Japanese characters in the book. Like Jay mentioned, there was not an Ur-Elf who was ethnically Japanese. There is no connection drawn between the real-life Earth Japanese people and elves. We are just explicitly told it is Japanese. That's the end of the story. I want to call that insensitive, but it's so weird and out of place that I I can't even in good conscience say that it's like as bad as other things in this book i mean i don't want to make like a tier list of racism in this book so i don't (laughs) i don't know how it stacks up against other racist incidents but i will say that i feel like it follows on a long history of orientalism Mm -hmm. in that it's saying that like the culture of this eastern nation is in some way mystical and powerful Mm -hmm. and imbued with something that we as westerners can't understand yeah which is really othering and really dehumanizing so yeah Uh, She learns her magic powers by saying Japanese words. The same four Japanese words over and over again. Yes, she did not use a lot of different (laughs) Japanese words. The investigation into the traitor's identity continues, leading to the murder of a minor character. His name was Lord Ramsey. I don't remember anything about him, but he's dead now, so it doesn't matter. Avril and co. discover the scene, and they are falsely accused of the murder very, very briefly before the queen, who is Vincent's mother, comes in and like intuitively knows that Avril didn't actually murder anyone, but she still fires Avril for quote, not being mature enough, unquote. Out of nowhere, a fairy door opens and Avril takes it in the hopes of getting back home. She thinks that she's going back to the nunnery that she came from, but she winds up in dot 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 arc number five, New Orleans 2, Civil War. It was at this point that I realized this novel could functionally be set literally anywhere for all the difference that the setting makes. <laughs> yes. The fact that she's able to jump from 1700s France to colonial America to God Realm number one to Antebellum South or whatever. And the way that the narrative like unfolded like was exactly the same. The way the characters talked and acted and their values were all the same. Yes. That was what made me realize like setting. It doesn't matter in this book. It's literally all just like a painted backdrop. Which a lot of picaresque narratives are guilty of. But yes, it it raises a lot of questions about authorial intent. Avril ends up in New Orleans like she thought she would. But now she is there during the beginnings of the Civil War. It's 1861. For context, she ostensibly grew up in 1788. Avril does not react in the slightest to everyone she knows definitely being dead and the racial implications of this time period versus where she grew up in are never touched on, of course. These new, more modern nuns take her in and get her dressed up only to task her to do chores again. She's actually glad. She's so glad. Because she's like, she gets there and she's like, how am I going to pay the bills? (laughs) Stupid. Which, like, okay, girl, get the bag, but... Yeah, like, like go home. Yeah. So Cirrus appears in this time, and he's climbing up a tree, 
and he talks to Avril through a window or jumps through a window to talk to her and reveals because we care that Nunez is actually a gargoyle and like functionally immortal. So he's still alive and he's become a Confederate general. (laughs) (laughs) He's going to. (laughs) So she, she learns about this new MacGuffin called the sword of immortals Bane, which is just supposed to get her back to her own time. But the only problem is it belongs to Zachary, who is a Sithirian believed dead. It's just a MacGuffin. Don't worry too much about the specific details. It's like a sword with a clock in it that you can you can time travel with. Yeah. And Zachary's been missing for like the whole book and people will occasionally mention that fact and that's it. That's it. So Nunez is inexplicably still pursuing Avril. I guess it's because of her magic elf blood that he really wants or something. Avril joins up with a minor character, Megan, who is a union doctor slash nurse, and her and Cirrus work with, with Megan for a little bit until Nunez's Confederate gargoyle army <laughs> attacks them. <laughs> Avril uh... escapes back to Scythera, and Vincent and Cirrus protect her from invading gargoyles, and then Nunez is like not able to kill her because Cirrus and Vincent are protecting her. So instead, he teleports her to the desert. This kicks off. So, is Rebel's name really Rebel? Avril asked Fletcher and took a bite out of the buttered beans on her tin plate. A cowhand passed her aboard with a loaf of warm rye bread on it, and Avril took a few slices. No, it's Smith. He got his nickname from the war. Fletcher spooned hot mashed potatoes onto her plate. The Civil War? Yeah, he was a Union soldier who used to dress as a Confederate slave. Then, when the Masters fell asleep, Rebel would sneak through the encampment slitting throats. Avril almost choked on her steak. That's nice, she said dryly. Avril's just so awful. (laughs) That's nice. (laughs) Arc number six, The Wild West. Uh, Probably the most... um, tasteless arc of our entire selection today would you agree i would agree it was so tasteless in fact that it prompted an actual conversation between lauren m davis and some other people on twitter yes eventually leading to lauren m davis claiming that in order to research this novel she personally met with several different native american uh, tribes to discuss their culture and practices so keep that in the back of your mind when we start to describe to you this ensuing scene Avril is promptly attacked by what I believe to be the most racist Native American stereotypes ever conceived of in the 21st century media, with such names as Hunting Owl and Panther Rose. I don't want to dwell here other than to say that it's deeply uncomfortable. Uh, I cannot tell you how little I wanted to read the phrase, and I quote, your scalp will decorate the inside of my wigwam. Mm. Um, not for nothing, uh, the Navajo, which this is supposed to be, uh, the Navajo did not use wigwams, uh, but... You know, what with them living in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So, Panther Rose is the daughter of the chief and convinces her cronies to capture Avril rather than kill her and takes her to her father... Avril just kind of sits there awaiting trial in a teepee. She starts to use the word teepee hereafter. And then off screen, we hear some cowboys run in and gun down the entire tribe. This group of cowboys is led by a man named Kevin Fletcher. um, And they are looking for a totem charm. It's a ring that makes everything you touch afflicted with a quote, fierce amnesia unquote uh which is interesting but never comes up again so forget about it no wait it does they use it on a villain at the very end oh there you go okay they get one use out of it it is a MacGuffin so specific that you know it's going to get exactly one use and (laughs) no other well that's why i was kind of surprised (laughs) it has such key item energy (laughs) it's like it literally is like used to progress plot (laughs) right right not for this narrative but I really like the idea of a treasure hunting magical cowboy. I didn't like it here. I don't like Fletcher as a character per se, but just the phrase 
magical treasure hunting cowboy, you can write like so many pulp fiction stories in your head. Also, he's a god. Also, he's a god. But like, take that stupid part out of there and just leave it with the cowboy stuff. Yeah. Fletcher is a Florentine, which is the nation that is aligned against Scythera. And they think that there's going to be a war and that there is a a sellout in the court working for them. Despite not liking or trusting these cowboys at all, Avril agrees to join them on a train ride to California. And in the train bar, she gets so drunk with Fletcher and his people that she gets a hangover the next morning. There's this brief sequence of her being like a, a field hand with the cowboys in California. She uses her Japanese magic to help the cowboys do cowboy stuff. Fletcher makes a pass at her and they kiss, but it's like clear that she's not 100% into it. She just kind of um, humors it for a little bit, but her heart belongs to Vincent ultimately. One day they are attacked by cattle wrestlers and in the fray, Avril finds the sword of Immortal's Bane in Fletcher's things, which apparently means that Fletcher is a Florentine and he's the one who let the gargoyles almost kill her back in Louisiana. Somehow this means that like he's supposed to be in league with Nunez, but Fletcher had already renounced Nunez before this because Avril was just so beautiful that he didn't want to threaten that immaculate beauty. Yeah, sure. You tell me. I don't. <sighs> There's a lot going on at that part. <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah, that's. Talk about random entrances. One of the random ranch hands turns out to be Vincent and then just says in one single sentence that Nunez, this villain who has defined the previous like four or five chapters, is dead. He killed him off screen. This news is delivered to us in one line. All of this is happening during a skirmish with the cattle rustlers like bullets are still whizzing around them and she has like this force field up while they're having this discussion the three of them somehow a rustler gets the drop on avril and hits her on the back of the head with a rock and this kills her yep uh like literally kills her arc seven is avril's death resurrection and loss of soul vincent takes her back to scythera and Fletcher comes with, despite the whole him being a Florentine thing. Vincent takes her to the pool of preservation and then asks his father to help, even though, like, Eli says that this would be against the rules of nature. And I guess this kind of goes back to the whole God cosmology kind of thing. But he convinces his father and gets the powers. When he goes back to find Avril's body, there's a bunch of dead angels strewn around in a weird looking figure holding Avril's soul in a glass vial. And they fight, and Fletcher saves her in the nick of time, and they resurrect Avril and all the angels. Yay, end of end of scene. Avril not having her soul means that the next time she dies, it will be as if she never existed. Like there won't be any Shadowlands for her, there won't be any six realms for her. She will just kind of poof out of existence. Yeah, so uh, this might be a good place for me to jump in and talk a little bit more about the cosmology. Please. L let's break down the human life cycle in full. Okay, so you are alive on Earth and then you die. Your soul goes to the Shadowlands, which we'll talk about in more detail later, so I'll just leave that there for now. Or it goes to the Heavenly Realms, which is the Six Realms. Um, where you can have a job. <laughs> it is unclear if you can die as a soul. However, if you are a mortal with no soul, which is what Avril currently is, you can be alive in any of the realms until you die, at which point you just cease to exist. What happens to your soul, which presumably still exists in this case we know it does avril's soul is in a vial right um what would happen to your soul in that case is like totally unexplored so essentially right now avril is like herself she is a living body fundamentally unchanged from how she was when she had a soul except that she doesn't have a soul which means that if she dies she'll just disappear yep um this is allegedly a very huge raising of the stakes yeah this means something yes but basically what it feels like is in this world souls are like a one-up that you have <laughs> or you don't like in ready player one it is like ready player one or like scott pilgrim like she is now one life away from dying i guess forever yeah oh god i want to go off on this forever but please continue with Zachary's alive and we care 
and he was attacked by Morgwars, which are, I think, I could be wrong, I think they are humans who rove around and kill people with poison nooses. Sounds like one of those gimmicky Elden Ring weapons. Like a gimmick Elden Ring enemy. <laughs> it's weird, but it's neat. Uh, I'm okay with it. Uh, they rove around the uh, the god realms. Yes. So like maybe they're a god race. But this also also introduces the fact that gods can be killed with like random weapons. Because as we'll see later, like you can bring a gun bring <laughs> into heaven. Get me the hell out of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Avril ends up in the palace library where she encounters a hologram of her mother, whom she doesn't really seem to care too much about. Uh, and one of our dramatic readings will illustrate this. It's something like this cross time Google Earth for stalkers. It never comes back. But Vincent's mother is there and she charges Avril with rescuing Rebecca, who's apparently been kidnapped and taken to Florin as a prisoner. It all happens off screen and we just have to trust her on this to do this she needs to find the bearer of the crown of immortals bane which is currently owned by an atlantean in hawaii avril who will cease to exist if she is killed accepts this dangerous task that offers her nothing in return and won't benefit her in the slightest yeah seems right doesn't Vincent's mom like threaten her in some way? Isn't she like you'll you won't be able to live here anymore or something if you don't do it? I don't know, not with violence or anything. But she, the the queen is just very rude for no reason. Yeah, but yeah, her mission kicks off arc number eight, rescuing Rebecca, Hawaiian cop vacation. Before we get into Hawaii, I want to comment on a scene where Avril has one last little cute scene with Vincent. Uh, she plays a drinking game with him to ask him some really superficial questions, and it is directly acknowledged that she's drinking just as a crutch for her anxiety. She and Vincent pointedly do not do it, in case you were wondering, and she sneaks off back to Earth. She drinks a lot for social anxiety, for what it's worth. She drinks a lot for social anxiety. She just gets drunk, puts on her little black nothing dress, goes to see Vincent, and then sneaks to Earth. Uh, that's the scene. She steals the fairy door necklace. That's why she had to get him drunk. Because he wouldn't give it to her. Okay, see? There you go. I was wrong. I take the L on this, Lauren. That scene had an auxiliary purpose, and that makes sense. Avril arrives on Earth in modern-ish times. Uh, enough to where there's highways everywhere. And she is promptly almost run over by a car. A couple cops pick her up, and she uses her magic powers to convince them that she's really from the 1700s. I don't think this super works on them, but despite having no ID, no history, no family, the sheriff's office decides to hire her as, like, a cop handmaiden. Yeah, there's only one kind of story. Keep this in mind, listener. Keep keep this idea of someone being a cop handmaiden in mind. Yes, for yes, reasons. Please, please do. Um, <laughs> so Avril hangs out with some cop named Amy to get her ready for her exciting career in law enforcement. Avril enters a kayak race and learns how to drive. Cirrus appears, and for some reason, Avril's like really hesitant to leave her life as a cop, even though she is in horrible danger just by existing. And has an explicit mission to be across the ocean right now looking for this this crown in Hawaii. But whatever, uh, Cirrus flies away in scene. Avril makes a German Shepherd puppy appear for Amy, which is horribly irresponsible. Apparently Amy always really wanted a dog, but so that's okay. Well, they have to have a dog for their buddy cop comedy. Right. Oh, you're so right. I forgot about the buddy cop comedy. Yeah. So Amy... Holly, the dog, the dog's name is Holly, and Cirrus. Holly, no relation. <laughs> Holly, no relation. <laughs> Holly, the dog. Uh, and Cirrus and Avril fly to Hawaii. There's like a weird mini fun and games montage where Avril lights a a flight attendant's uh, britches on fire. Britches, sick. Yeah, her britches. Right, which very interesting choice of words there. In flight, by the way. In flight. Right, right. Which is not only horribly rude and very dangerous, but double dangerous on an airplane. Then they go get Froyo. Yeah, then they go get Froyo and go to Hawaii. They find the Atlantean. Her name is Nicole, and she is the bride of Lord Simon, who is some Cytherian who we were all kind of suspicious of in the court intrigue scene. They're apparently just hanging out in Hawaii, and I think they walk in on them making out or doing it or something. 
There's some more exposition that doesn't matter. Right, there were eight realms originally and Atlantis sang. Because it's Atlantis. And then another one got destroyed or something. And so yes. like she's the queen of a place that's gone and like she has a magic crown that makes you immortal or something like that. Something like that. Which Avril does not take, despite Nicole's insistence that she do so. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Avril, who could die... At any moment, she's like, no, I couldn't. And Nicole's like, but I want to live with Lord Simon on Earth like a mortal life and have mm-hmm. kids and I don't want to watch my kids die. And Avril's like, I don't want your stupid crown. <laughs> <laughs> I think your stupid crown that I desperately need until I get my soul back. They talk about the plan to rescue Rebecca because that's what all of this is about, by the way, in case we forgot, because I kind of did. So they can't go with the crown plan, according to Nicole, Because the Florentines would rather kill Rebecca than lose her. So all of this was for nothing, explicitly. But since they can't use the crown plan, they all put their heads together and they brainstorm a new plan to sneak into Florin under the guise of being wandering troubadours in a little band. And I think this would be a good time to point out that you can't enter the fortress city of florin because it has the wizard sphere from ready player one surrounding it it is explicitly a magic sphere that cannot be entered that extends even into the ground that you cannot pass through unless you have the right genes (laughs) right which fletcher has necessitating using him before they leave hawaii though avril goes for a swim in the pool And Vincent is there once again, revealing that he has time travel powers, meaning that he could have chosen to use them at any point to take Avril home, but chose not to because he wanted her to himself. So for those keeping score, this is the second time Vincent has intentionally and wantonly kidnapped Avril. And despite being a god... If she dies right now in the state where if she dies, she goes away forever, she's gone. Like, he can't get her back. He can do a lot of things. Maybe he can time travel to a point where she was still alive. I don't know. But, like, (laughs) she's gone. Yep. Vincent kind of half offers to take her back home to her time, but Avril suddenly really invested in saving his sister. So she says... I'm going to stick with the plan. They make out. Cirrus and Amy also make out. Cirrus had made out with Megan the nun earlier. He doesn't really pursue them. Like, he just suddenly is making out with them. (laughs) All of this culminates in arc number nine. Rescuing Rebecca 2. The Squeakwell. Time for the road chip. Avril, Vincent, and Fletcher form a musical group known as the Perils. They rehearse for a little bit. They sneak into Florin. Like uh, like Jay mentioned, Fletcher has Florentine blood, so this kind of goes over without a hitch. Uh, Florin is an oddly modern place. There are loudspeakers, explicitly LED light-emitting diode lights, uh, and Rebecca is being kept in a cell that is locked with a biometric key. Uh, I thought this was kind of interesting because, like, Florentines uh, apparently don't have magic powers and Cytherians do. So one has had to learn how to adapt and the other has kind of leaned on their magic powers. So they have more antiquated technology. I actually think that's really, really neat. It is interesting that there's gods with, like, different cultures and, like, ability sets. But it's also weird that then Fletcher, who is florentine has this illusion magic yes yes he has illusion magic oh god it's so weird um whatever they get into the court to do their little performance the dance slash musical number is a microcosm of their dumb little triangle which was was naked but it worked thematically i guess it served a purpose they rescue rebecca and escape there's some werewolves. I don't think it really matters. Jay, do you have any other color on the rescuing Rebecca scene? No, I really, my eyes were glazed over at that point. I think they do it in one giant paragraph in one little line. So there's not a lot of detail there. This book does that a lot yes. where there will be like a lot of page space dedicated to basically nothing. And then like a major plot point will be glossed over in a single sentence. It'll be like, they rescued her and then went home. Yeah, so they rescue her and then they go to Toth, which is a place, apparently, and have to bivouac and then they move back on to Scythera. 
Fletcher, back in the courts of Sethera, receives a hero's welcome and is given the cognomen Wolf Trickster because he apparently tricked some werewolves with his with his illusion powers in rescuing Rebecca in one of the giant paragraphs that we skimmed over. He also becomes a knight. I don't think this ever comes back, nor does the cognomen Wolf Trickster. Uh, Avril becomes dubbed Lady Louisette. Uh, Zachary gives her the Sword of Immortal's Bane and a bracelet from Rebecca, which I thought might end up being important, but it never comes back up, if I recall correctly. I don't remember it coming up. Yep, see, no. Victorious after all, Avril teleports back to the harbor in Calais in her own time, now with a sword and still without her soul. Oh, Andrew, 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 we have to pause lest we forget the most important prize that she wins after saving rebecca what a chest full of money i didn't know she got a chest full of money yes the king gave her a chest full of money which she is much pleased to receive because now she doesn't have to have a job now she doesn't need a heaven job (laughs) (laughs) not only that but it's magic god money that will warp into the currency of whatever country you're traveling through yes Yes, and they literally call it a salary. Yes, they do use the word salary. So, yeah, so she still doesn't have her soul, but she's back home in her own time, and she arrives just in time to see Uncle Thomas before he leaves. Months pass, apparently, because Avril turns 18 in April, and in a sentence so short I almost missed it, she confronts her mother (laughs) about her elf heritage, (laughs) and her mom just owns up to it. Her mom's like, yeah, I knew the whole time, but don't tell anybody. A wink. And then more months must pass because we go from April to December and then Vincent appears giving her a dress to wear for Rebecca's upcoming holiday party. Yeah. Lots going on right now. Um, This party takes place in what I like to call arc number 10, Santa Claus, Lord Fortis. Vincent and Avril arrive at the party at Infinite Glen Circle just in time for Father Christmas to give gifts to everyone. Uh, I guess this is like a lion, witch, and wardrobe kind of situation where Santa's real? I I, I couldn't quite track it, because, I mean, Santa in this scene isn't really Santa, but it doesn't preclude there being a quote-unquote real Santa. I thought it was the real Santa. Maybe it was. Santa gives Avril a gift from Nicole. The crown, the one that she refused so pointedly, maybe not even two chapters ago. The party continues, and then afterwards, Avril's like walking home or whatever, and then there's a reindeer that appears to her as apparently foretold in a dream that I skimmed over. The reindeer talks and says he has yet another gift for her and then transforms into Santa, who is apparently an evil shapeshifter, that Avril identifies as Lord Fordis, who I don't blame you for not knowing who this person is because he appeared like once in chapter one and is only mentioned afterwards. He's just some random Sither and Lord. He was kind of creepy at first, but that's about all I knew about him. But now he's an evil shapeshifter and every mysterious animal she's ever encountered this whole time has been him watching her. He wants avril's elven blood and he will give her soul back if she offers her blood to him and if she ever betrays this pact he's placed this warlock's curse on her soul and it would like destroy the soul or whatever it's just like a fail safe she has to live with him too because of course she has to get kidnapped and given menial chores to do this is like the fifth or sixth time this has happened in the story. Yeah, she gets warped to a new location and then is assigned domestic labor. Yeah, so um, Vincent is there in her quarters at the castle and offers to help her escape. But Avril says no, because she she says that Lord Fortis is going to tear them apart somehow. Anything, Jay? Anything? No, you got this. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Lord Fortis summons her for an audience and the doctor who was there who fixed her up when she first got bitten by Nunez. He's there to like arrange the blood transfusion. He doesn't support Lord Fortis explicitly and like does not like him, but he doesn't want Avril to be marred 
with so many bite marks and hideous scars. He doesn't want her beauty tarnished. Yeah. While he's preparing her for this blood transfusion, he, he slips her this little note that says, The only way to break the warlock's curse is to end the life it was meant to take. The Shadowlands await you. And then in this note is a poison pill. I think it's like Hemlock or something. Avril takes it just in time for the castle to be under attack. I guess this kicks off what in Lauren's head is like the Avengers endgame montage of all the heroes coming together and like fighting the big bad guy. But it doesn't work because we don't care about any of these characters or know the villain at all. Yeah, most of these characters are strangers to us and to each other. There's a dragon and Vincent's writing it and along with him are Rebecca Fletcher is there and he's wielding an M16 and a shotgun. There's some wizard named Neolil. <laughs> there's, there's some wizard named Neolil <laughs> who who Lauren is convinced that we know. <laughs> and then Amy is there, the cop, and she's like strapped with all of these <laughs> automatic pistols and they're just shooting at all of these <laughs> morgue wars. And then the dragons, no... The dragon fights Lord Fortis, and Lord Fortis transforms into a dragon, and he's like, Avril, get on my body and fight Vincent for me. <laughs> and then Avril's like, why? And then Fortis is like, because I said so. There's no reason. And then they they, they fly. Um, Fortis kills Vincent's dragon, and then Avril and Vincent have their final boss fight. Vincent is dual-wielding katanas. <laughs> like, it's... Like, it's freaking Elden Ring. He, like, it's Elden Ring. He is a he is a Dex bleed build king. He's got his two <laughs> uchis. He's gonna, he's gonna fucking take this guy down. They are explicitly katanas. <laughs> they are explicitly katanas, and he's explicitly dual wielding them. He is a slave to the meta. He's like these humanoid characters. They don't stand a chance against my bleed build. <laughs> And before they can really, like, actually fight, um, Avril succumbs to her poison. Pause. Because there is something here that I would like to introduce so that listeners know that this is a tool that has been in Avril's arsenal since she learned magic. Yes. But that she never uses for any practical reason. Andrew, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, the crown that makes her immortal? No, good guess. Um, no, I was referring to her shadow clone jutsu, wherein she can summon at least one, maybe more, fully autonomous clones of herself that, unlike the shadow clones in, like, Naruto, are not illusions, they can do things for her. Which we know because she has one of them go to music class for her so that she can go on a spy mission earlier. What this suggests is that people can interact with these shadow clones and are convinced that it is her. However, it's not. It is a clone with which she will later just sort of magically remerge. Does it get her memories? Does she get its memories so that they both know what happened? I don't know. Why didn't she leave a shadow clone of herself? in Lord Fortis's dungeon and escape with Vincent. I don't know. <laughs> Why didn't she just make any clones of herself at literally any point so that it could do the dangerous things for her? I don't know. It just didn't. She just didn't. Who can say? Anyway, now she's in hell. Now she's in dinosaur zombie hell. We must now enter arc number 11, which I have titled Dino Danger. <laughs> you can't speak Japanese in hell. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Death Realm is not just the Shadow Realm at the risk of being heretical because very briefly she's in this nebula starscape and there's like a fire pit full of dark creatures which like might be demons but avril like runs away from it and then reaches a gate to the shadowlands with a bunch of and i quote turbaned nomads which i guess isn't super problematic but it raised an eyebrow so i, I think it's worth noting they're sitting out front and they tell her that no one has been able to enter because there is a goblin out front who is asking them riddles that they cannot answer. The goblin asks riddles for babies. 
And then Avril correctly answers them, which angers the goblin immensely, and he keeps accusing her of cheating. I think there are like three baby riddles, and this sequence repeats itself as many times. In true rumpled stiltskin fashion, she guesses his name when he asks her her final question. His name is Death. I actually think that portraying Death as like a silly goblin and not a cloaked Grim Reaper opens up a lot of interesting philosophical possibilities. I don't have a problem with this story idea. To have him not just be a skeleton with a scythe implies a level of thought or at least an interesting perspective on death, which I think is valuable. Yeah, I fully agree. Death in this version of of the world is like a pretty pathetic and he's like laughable like from an audience perspective like he seems extremely silly which i think is fitting because in this world like death is more like a thing that just moves you laterally across planes yes so like it's not like this this grand end so like him being sort of pitiable and and i don't know frail i think makes sense yeah definitely makes sense and it's definitely interesting so Good job, Lauren. Um, That was pretty original. That's another writing point for you. Yeah. (laughs) What are we at? Two? That's two. The goblin opens the gate. The Shadowlands are a jungle full of tropical animals. There are pixies there, and they inform her that the good witch can get her out of the Shadowlands. She keeps going and sees some mermaids, and the mermaids tell her to beware of nightfall and to find... Cain's volcano where the good witch lives which is like a two-day trek away when night does fall avril and the nomads are attacked by velociraptors actual jurassic park style velociraptors it's not that weird like the dinosaurs are all dead so they're in the afterlife well if you believe what the media tells us well avril tries to run but gets caught in a snare She has this weird sequence where she manages to free herself, but she's too high up and the velociraptors are still there. So she just kind of dangles. She falls asleep. She dreams of the gardens of Helix, which is a place that exists apparently in Scythera. I don't remember it, but Zachary is there. He informs her that there's been a truce brokered with Florin and just like vaguely warns her not to die in a very unhelpful way. He mentions that he has something to warn her about Vincent, but the dream ends right before he can explain. Avril wakes up to a man riding a Brachiosaurus who helps her get down from the tree. This is Robert Louis Stevenson, the real-life author of Treasure Island, whom Avril apparently knows of and is a fan of wait a second hold on a second stevenson has been stuck in the shadowlands for all this years all these years oh my god robert louis stevenson died in 1894 (laughs) 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 well it's the circular timeline you know to have died implies that you were never alive so therefore everyone who is dead has already been dead, and is just not alive yet. So actually, this makes sense. But how could he have written Treasure Island? How could she know about it? When would she have had time to read Treasure Island? (laughs) I don't know, Jay. I don't know. The only time she was alive after the 1800s was when she was in, like, 1980s California and Hawaii. And she spent that entire time doing police training and then tracking down the queen of a dead nation, and then immediately leaving. She read it on the plane. No, she didn't read it on the plane, because we know what she did on the plane. We know definitively what she was doing on the plane, (laughs) and it was committing, like, air crime. Arson. (laughs) Wait, wait, okay, small suggestion right here, Lauren. Um, Make her read it on the plane, or make this a fictional author, because this is so weird, and it just raises all these questions that we don't need to be dealing with in a book of this um, level of seriousness. So yeah, real-life author who died... Over a hundred years after Avril died, is here in hell with her, riding a Brachiosaurus. This is one of the more straightforward plot points in the book. (laughs) Yeah, so he is here in the Shadowlands because of Mortis Capers, who is like the evil king of the Shadowlands. The good witch is like his mistress or whatever. The aforementioned good witch who the pixies told her to go visit. Whatever. Do we have to talk about the racism in this part? I don't want to talk about any more racism. We will get to him. 
in a cave with all the other people stuck in the Shadowlands who refuse to serve Mortis Capers. Avril has a dream of Vincent dying and then being chased by a T-Rex and then Vincent comes back to life, but then he has to swear to love the woman who owned the T-Rex and then the woman eating Avril's heart. And and then the next morning, news comes that King Mortis has promised freedom to anyone who can interpret a nightmare he had. If they can't deliver the true dream and its true meaning, they will be sentenced to death, which I suppose means they will be obliterated by by the universe's rules. Avril undertakes this journey with Robert believing that dream that she just had to be King Mortis's dream. So then they meet Carnivo the Hangman, who is some kind of dignitary of King Mortis. He's not he's not a very um sensitive character, I would say. Surprise, surprise. <sighs> yeah, so we're told that some physical feature like quote unquote gives away his Indian heritage or something. Yeah, it's really yeah. like why? No, he's explicitly othered as not white. He proceeds to be very slimy and untrustworthy and backstabby. He tries to like blackmail them for Avril's interpretation of the dream so that like he can give it is that right? Like, so that he can give it to the king first? Yes. Okay. But then, surprise, surprise, one of the guards is actually King Mortis, reveals that, yes, this actually was the real dream, and then he allows Robert Louis Stevenson and Avril to fly away on pterodactyls. They part ways. Robert Louis Stevenson says that he's going to go to one of the six realms named Daleway, which we know very little about other than that it is very replete with dragons it's kind of like fourth wing fantasy coded it seems like to be honest it's like british isles y mm -hmm. and there's dragons i don't know very fast and loose with these other nations on her way back to the land of the living avril encounters a blind beggar who's had his eyes gouged out and the blind beggar is like crying out to her in this weird overly formal english talking about how he was betrayed and had his eyes gouged out and whatever and now that avril has been resurrected she apparently has like more power over life or something and she uses it to restore sight to this beggar lo and behold it is vincent and he promptly asks avril to marry him because sure sure kicking off our shortest arc number 12 and they lived happily ever after dot 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 or do they mother avril did a double take and stretched out her hand to touch her mother's the image zoomed out and became an overhead view of avril's college then with another touch the house shrank into a small dot on a map of france she touched the hologram again and her mother rematerialized the image walked avril's way again but this time, the hologram passed right through Avril and disappeared into the wall. Congratulations, you found the Scryer's Hive, said a lustrous alto from a dark corner of the room. Avril pivoted on her heel to see Queen Valerie moving gracefully towards her. How odd, I was just thinking of her. My mother's dead by now, though, Avril said. Me when my mom is dead. Yeah, the literally... <laughs> Most normal human reaction to your mother being dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Avril and Vincent have a lovely wedding after Avril turns 19 so that Uncle Thomas can attend. King Mortis, again, dies off screen and Avril chugs champagne. Avril's father is there at the ceremony. Every single freaking character is at the ceremony. They all have stupid names, and it's even worse seeing them next to each other. I, I can't get over it. The next morning, Avril is crowned Princess of Scythera. And then, in case you forgot the prologue, like I did, uh, plot twist, the simulation ends and Lydia gets out of her video game. The next couple of chapters are from Lydia's perspective, whom we have been led to completely forget about for the entire course of the story. I thought the book would be over and the rest would be like special features or whatever, but no, this is Lydia Trace's entire story. Yes, so, so she gets out of the simulation. We learn that she's an intern at this corporation for college credit. 
that she is the first person to finish the game and that the goal of the game was to marry Vincent. Right. Which, if that's the goal, she could have done that on, like, day two because he was after Avril the whole time. But apparently, no, you have to go through every single step in Avril's life in the correct order in order to win, question mark, which raises so many questions about the game and its mechanics as a game. It's very Ready Player One in that regard. Um, It's very clearly like you have to follow these exact certain steps for my own ego. She dryly discusses the meta of the game, which I guess also kind of functions as a commentary on the plot. She's like, oh, you you made this wrong choice at the desert scene. You shouldn't have done that, blah, blah, blah. It's it's so dry. It, it like trivializes what we've just spent 300 pages reading. It made me so mad that if the prologue weren't there, this would be a mortal sin for the book. But uh, I can't really dwell on this for too long because apparently in this medium layer of fiction, superheroes are real and zombies Because Lydia just disinterestedly watches this on the TV, on the news, like it's nothing. Uh, There's a superhero named Knight Stalker, that's Knight Stalker with a K, who can control the undead. And he has a supervillain called Deoxidizer. And this is always delivered in like Maiden Butler exposition through the TV. And we're just supposed to accept this. And the thing that he's using his superpowers for on the TV is what? (laughs) To control the undead? Yeah, but do you remember what he's trying to control his his horde to do in that bit? Oh, oh, oh! To stop the gang violence! To stop inner city gang violence. Lydia, like, solemnly shakes her head and is like, Mmm, the crime in this nation. (laughs) It's like... It's so stupid. It's so stupid. You can really see Jordan Peterson, like, (laughs) like, distantly, like, we need art to tame the chaos of our of our ailing world. Yeah, I know he's not in this meeting, but like, we need to tell him he's, he should get in a necromancy if he really wants to stop this inner city violence. Speaking of people <laughs> stealing each other's ideas and suing, I think that Lauren M. Davis should be sued by Jordan Peterson for ripping off his mm, philosophy yes. of degenerating America. Oh my God. <laughs> Lauren, we'll see you in court. <laughs> Uh, this is a joke. This is rhetorical hyperbole. In Minecraft. We'll do it in Minecraft. That that doesn't work anymore. Someone got arrested um, for saying in Minecraft. So uh, In Second Life. Okay. Um, the next day, Lydia is summoned by Troy Chevalier, the designer of the game. In case you forgot, Chevalier is Vincent's surname on Earth. You know, aside from the surname, he's a spitting image of Vincent. So Lydia has ostensibly been spending 300 pages romancing this man virtually. Uh, he's uh, presumably an AI in the game, but like still, it's kind of weird. Lydia critiques the story some more, says that they fell in love too quickly. Again, this is so cheap and so weird. That scene just kind of ends. Then she goes hiking with her family and then drops very casually that she has a history of like delusions, like mental health issue delusions. Yeah, while she's hiking with her family, she says that Her work has been going well, but the other day she had this issue where she thought she could see people's souls, and she talks about it as though it's a thing that's happened before, and then her parents are like, why did your psychiatrist take you off those meds? You should still be on them. (laughs) And then she's just like, eh. Eh. (laughs) Right, right. And keep in mind, this like soul-seeing thing was not not in the text of the book, at least not as far as I remember. No. No, absolutely not. The book, like, incepts a scene into itself. Right. I felt like I was being gaslit. I was like, this was not in the scene in the company that just happened, but whatever. Um, So there are other people in the forest. They're wearing cloaks. They're elves, like, from the game, like elves, like Avril. Um, Her dad is apparently from Daleway, that place I mentioned with the dragons. And he fathered a child with a mortal woman. So Lydia's ostensible mother whose name is divinity trace is not her biological mother she is an isruesian vampire isruia is i think another of the six realms doesn't matter don't worry about it there's vampires there and lydia's father xander is a light keeper no we are not told what this means but they own a lighthouse so maybe that's related it means they're responsible for the crystal in the lighthouse 
Okay, sure, whatever, that's fine. You know the crystal that does the thing that it does with the sun? No, I don't know the sun crystal. This is not a bit, that's what it's for. They keep the lighthouse, which is where the crystal is, and like the crystal ensures that the earth stays the right distance away from the sun. Oh. That's why they have to be on earth, because they don't want gods to be doing that from the god realm, because then like if an evil god could do it, then he then the evil god would like cast the earth into the sun. Okay, that's interesting, I didn't know that. That makes sense, right? That's all airtight? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> All airtight. They sentence Xander to execution. Xander kind of stoically accepts this. Lydia watches her father die. Her adoptive mother, Divinity, tells Lydia to find her birth mother. If not, then, quote, what is buried may never rise again, and the world will be free to do as it pleases. Whatever that means. It's kind of a banger, though. It, it is kind of a banger. I like the I like the line. That's why I kept it. Uh, the elf who killed Lydia's father warns her that the gods will throw themselves at her to try to force a relationship with her, which is a very interesting threat. Then Lydia just drives back and goes to work the next day. And she just is glum and angry. Yeah, she's got to go nine to five. Right. Despite all of that, like, God money that she has. Well, at this point, when I'm reading this, I am furious. I'm about to, like, come to Lauren Davis's house and have a few words. Because I thought she had wasted 300 pages of my life. And she kind of did. But it's okay because Troy's true mother, he reveals in a separate meeting, is Avril Louisette. So the entire story that we've just read, at least as far as plot beats go, is ostensibly true. And then we learn that Lydia's birth mother is the Atlantean lady from Hawaii who had the crown, because apparently that matters. Which kind of begs the question, she was like, I think, married to Lord Simon, so I don't know where Xander came from. I guess we'll learn that in the sequel, if I if I cared. I care. I care, Lauren. Don't let Andrew naysay you into not explaining it. I I'm care. sorry. I do care. I'm just getting heated because I'm, I'm remembering how horrible it was to read this. <laughs> then her job continues. She gets partnered up with this kid named Altair, a dark, curly-haired guy with sun-kissed skin and a strong build. And he abruptly shoulders into her upon noticing that there's a Black Widow spider on her. She gets a call from someone named Cade Fletcher, who no, is not the cowboy from the story. That was Kevin Fletcher. Ostensibly, there is no relation between these two characters. So Lydia tells Cade Fletcher that her parents have had an emergency, and he offers her a weekend job at the lighthouse that her parents own, because even... When she's not being Avril, Lydia's life is just a string of servile positions. It's very, very bleak. It's like a volunteer job if through the historical society yeah. that manages her parents' lighthouse. Yeah, but it is her parents' lighthouse, so shouldn't it kind of fall to her? Yeah, you would think. Uh, I don't know. I don't understand why there's this, like, intercessor. Right. <laughs> so Altair and Lydia go to the lighthouse together. For some reason, they just met each other, by the way. Altair goes to get groceries, and then Troy and Nicole appear. And then Troy and Lydia go jet skiing together, because Lydia doesn't want to talk about the plot. And and we learn through exposition that Troy and Altair grew up together, but then Altair developed dark powers by drinking... Avril's blood, kind of like Lord Fortis did. This is immediately forgotten about because a meteor shows up, strikes the water, creating a small tsunami that sweeps Lydia and Troy away, and then they get saved by Night Stalker, the superhero from the news broadcast at the beginning of the arc. And when when asked how how he knew that she was in trouble. Night Stalker says, ghosts tell me things, which I thought was funny, but I was not in the mood for, for a funny little line. It is funny. I gotta give him that. It's funny. I don't know. It's straightforward. It's helpful. It's well-timed. I gotta give him that. It made me laugh. I believe him. A ghost told him. I believe it. Um, It's very convincing. <laughs> Normally, if someone said that, I wouldn't believe them, but I do believe him. <laughs> the narrative has prepared me to believe him. So so there's been flooding in the lighthouse. They can't stay there. They go to an inn. 
Um, they need some kind of MacGuffin at Atlantis. I literally do not care anymore. Altair warns her not to go. And then Lydia kind of confronts him about the whole drinking Troy's mother's blood thing. Altair dismisses these accusations. Before he goes, he slips her this note saying that uh, Troy is the one who put a black widow on her and summoned the meteor. So she goes oh to God. her dorm. Troy's there. And she confronts him about Altair's accusations. And then in response, Troy asks her out and she accepts this and they go to like a rich person party. There's a freaking earthquake. Lydia almost falls into like hell or something or the Shadowlands. But then Night Stalker returns and saves her again and then warns her to stay away from Troy like he's a jealous lover. And he says like, you need to learn to master your abilities, Lydia. And then she starts flirting with Night Stalker they make out still at this party with a giant rift in the ground. Cade calls them and then says a ghost repaired the damage to the lighthouse. A, a literal ghost. And no one acknowledges that that's weird. I guess ghosts exist because zombies exist. You could just hire a ghost to clean your lighthouse. That's fine. They probably are cheap. They're probably they cheap. They don't need a lot of eat, so like they don't need money. That's their heaven job. Their their heaven job is to clean lighthouse. That, that's oh, what that's you a do good question. Now. I have to like update my human life cycle flowchart now because like in addition to stop existing, go to hell, then go to heaven, or go directly to heaven, there's apparently also become a ghost or zombie. But you can also be a zombie in hell. So, is that a different thing? <laughs> I don't know, Jay. Um, I don't think we'll ever know. <laughs> Troy tries to kidnap Lydia away from Night Stalker. Lydia kills Troy with her new powers by dumping a bunch of rocks on him. And while dying, he vows to get out of the Shadowlands and kill her. Night Stalker says that he has some kind of connection to the Six Realms. This is literally what he said. My father married a banshee from the Shadowlands after he became president, <laughs> which is like something out of Sonic High School for how much <laughs> shit it just opens up in one single sentence. The amount of things. Did you, you miss the part where, um, what was his name? Mortis, Mortis Lentils, Mortis Can, Mortis Cantor, Mortis. Yeah, Mortis Cantor, Mortis, Mortis Caper, Mort Caper. <laughs> Yeah, c caper, not lentil. <laughs> um, Mortis, ca <laughs> Mor <laughs> Mortis caper. He was replaced after Avril left by somebody who destroyed the monarchy and turned the Shadowlands into a representative democracy. Yes, he is now the president of hell. I do remember that, but uh, so I know presidents exist, but like <laughs> the turn of phrase. My father married a banshee from the Shadowlands after he became president is is just ridiculous to me. Yeah, it wasn't on my uh, Nova's playlist bingo card, I guess that's fair to say. Nothing was. Nothing was. They make out more. They fly away. Let's get this over with. It's the epilogue. Arc 14 is just Nova in the epilogue. Nova in first person describes her pins in grueling detail and then heads out into the bustling streets of New York City to run errands. In case you forgot, Nova is the character writing Lydia's story. Yes. And Lydia is the character playing Avril. Yes. So we are on the most external layer of frame now. Right. Nova has existed up to this point only insofar as to be introduced by the song that she's listening to as she writes each chapter. Mm -hmm. So, like, every chapter will be like, Nova is listening to blah, 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 blah. And then the chapter will happen. So, as a little taste of what's to come, Nova, who is explicitly white, I do not care what Lauren tweets, she is described as white in the text, is going through her day, doing errands, buying pens... And she's being followed by someone in blue. And it turns out that it's Cade Fletcher from the Lydia chapters. Ooh. End of the story. What's your name, traveler? <laughs> he asked, his smile more like a gargoyle's leer. Lady Avril Louisette. Do you like games, Avril? His voice was sly. Not particularly. 
Avril thought of her drinking game with Vincent and wondered what trouble the goblin was going to create. It's the only way to get through the gates to the Shadowlands, said the goblin. Who made that silly rule? Me! <laughs> All right, me, let's play your game. I'll ask you one question. If you answer it correctly, I'll let you in. The goblin clapped his hands in glee. What goes up high and comes down low can sing a song and hops to and fro. He grinned, pleased with himself. Um, a bird? The goblin's grin disappeared. Too easy, too easy. Let's have another go, shall we? But you said only one question. Avril argued. Well, now it's two. The goblin bobbed his head from side to side, taunting her. Okay, Avril sighed. Two questions. Well, Jay, I know I really put you through the ringer with that old synopsis, but I think we needed to define everything going on in this book because there is so much packed into over 300 pages of content, and I'm sure some of it was good. So would you like to tell me maybe something that you thought that Lauren did pretty well? Oh, Andrew, my my brave tarnished. Ye have carried me through these many toils. Um, me, your finger maiden, <laughs> through the plot of Nova's playlist. And ye have uh, fought honorably. Let it be my honor to light the fire of things that I liked about this book. We already mentioned a couple. Yes. The Persephone Hades uh, foreshadowing was nice. The Death Goblin and his riddles uh, was frankly delightful, a welcome addition to any story. <laughs> I would have been happy if he had showed up right in the middle of Catcher in the Rye. I wouldn't have even have given a shit. <laughs> Another thing I can add to that pile is Avril mentions Batman while in the simulation. This breaks the world on every level. Yes. Avril shouldn't know this. Uh, Lydia role-playing as Avril shouldn't say this because if she did, it should break the, the game's simulation. Like, characters shouldn't know how to respond to Batman. But I felt like her mentioning it kind of foreshadowed Night Striker a little bit. Yeah. Um, because he's obviously Batman. So I was like, all right, that kind of works. Wait, no, I don't um, know. Does it work, though? Because if, if she knows... About Batman, does that mean there is an identical or similar superhero in the real quote unquote world? I don't know. I, I just I just saw two things that were similar and I was like, oh, a pattern. <laughs> that was probably intentional. I like it when stories are intentional. Monkey brain pattern recognition. Yeah, no, my, my neurons went bzzzt, and I was like, ah. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I, I agree to a very limited extent. Uh, it clearly had a beginning and an end it had a middle even it was aristotelian in that way <laughs> i liked the vague idea of the novel at some level very deep within the nidus of certain core ideas kind of work for me abstractly there were so many asterisks on that sentence <laughs> <laughs> I, well i can't say the skeleton works because honestly, I think that's kind of an insult to skeletons. Mm. It's kind of like when you look at a whale flipper bone, you can tell that there was a hand there sometime in the distant past. It's very far abstracted, but but okay, let's let's strip a lot out. Strip all it down to the little flipper bone. Picaresque time travel narrative. We get some cool magic powers, some cool magic items. We meet some zany characters in new locations. That's a conceit. That is a sellable premise. Uh, that's a Dante-style travelogue. I, I don't know if that in and of itself is compelling, but I know what that's supposed to be, and I know whether or not I would want a story like that. If I can be a games journalist for a second, you could definitely say it has a little something for everyone. <laughs> In the way that it is constantly switching aesthetics, like, I don't know, there's gargoyle vampires, there's historical fiction, there's uh, zombies in hell, there's also a uh, dinosaur area. <laughs> there's these moments where it turns into like a Sherlock Holmes mystery where Avril is like, ah, he must have done it because his 
ink matches this guy's ink, and it's like, this seems weird for a character, but I, I, I like it in, in concept, I guess. Sure. We kind of skimmed over those bits in the summary because they're really inconsequential, but like, when you're reading them in the narrative, they feel like the genre is switching. So like, you don't get bored. Yes. I guess that's something. It is not monotonous. I thought it would be. The France act was kind of protracted. And I didn't know that it would be a picaresque novel. I thought it would just be twee little France adventures for the entire novel. I got very, very nervous, but it wasn't. It switches genre, like Jay said, every arc. So I would have settled for fantasy flavored twee little France adventures. I don't know if you've read The Inquisitor's Tale. It's like a middle grade novel with like some pictures in it. Uh-huh. Uh, a lot of pictures, actually, but it, it's really good. Okay. I was kind of hoping it would turn into that, but no. Alas and alack, it was not to be. No, okay, let me let me walk that back. Let me temper what I said. I like this kind of story better than I would Twee Little France Adventures. That's not to say anything about the intrinsic value of that. Okay, fair enough. Like I said, a little something for everyone. Yeah, a little something Whether for you everyone. like vampires, gargoyles, or... What was that other thing that they thought Nunez might have been for a minute? A demon? Yeah, just a demon. Hey, they're all in there. I mentioned this earlier in passing, but I do want to dwell on this because the extent to which you saved your ass, Lauren, it cannot be overstated. Talk about asterisks. If you had to have this exact confluence of extremely ill-advised story ideas, I'm glad you keep the magical world real in all levels of the narrative. It's real in Nova's story, it's real in Lydia's story, it's real in Avril's story. That is the only way you could do this without it being the equivalent of, and then it was all a dream. So I don't think it's a good idea to have a two level or one and two half level narrative, but if you had to, this was a very good way to keep weight throughout. Yeah, I guess that's the thing that ties them all together at the end of the day, because the three main characters, it's hard to be attached to Uh, Nova because we don't know her, Lydia because we also don't know her, and Avril because she's like not real, but she is real, but like the one that we knew isn't the real her, so it's like she's not, doesn't feel like a person. Were it all just a video game, were it all just Nova's story even, this would be completely worthless as a story. Say more about that. You just mean because the frame would cheapen it? Because the frame would cheapen it. Because if I could just say oh, nothing in Avril's story matters because it's just a video game, then why read 300 pages about it? If I could say, why read Lydia's story? It's just Nova's writing. Then why care about it? It goes up the chain. And the only way to save yourself from that fate is to make it real on all possible levels. It's Nova's all the way down. To be fair, though, I don't know why I read this, even (laughs) with the the god magic being intact on all levels of story. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, yeah, that doesn't help as much as save it from a worse fate, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that does. Multiple things can be bad, and some things can be worse than other things. Here's one other thing I'll say. I, I, I started to say this earlier, but like, I really think there's a reading of this book that reads it as a horror novel, mm. because no matter what like plane or version of reality you're on, it's it's all the same. You have to have a job. You can be killed with a gun. You have to have an apartment. And if you die, you just go somewhere else. You might go higher. You might go lower. You might move laterally. It doesn't matter. But then you'll just have to start over with a, <laughs> another job. And it's going to be the same job, just like cleaning somebody else's floor. I mean this completely unironically for the first time since like the first episode of the show. It is Kafka-esque. Like (laughs) the spirit of Kafka is really there. It's not there in like the execution of the actual writing technique because this novel probably has not been edited by more than Lauren herself and maybe not more than once or twice. But in conceit, this idea that like there is no escape from this perpetual cycle of like bureaucracy in which you are always in this mid to low tier rung is so Kafka. I didn't pick up on a lot of it because I was just so blown away by some of the other choices made. But taken alone, this aspect raises some very interesting questions. It's not pleasant, but I don't mean that in a negative sense. I think these ideas can be explored even if they're not uh, sunshine and daisies. Uh, I I just wish they were handled better i think this novel's greatest crime other than all of the horrible horrible racism is it implies all of these interesting 
ideas about uh, life after death in particular, and then it doesn't examine any of them. Nor does it ignore them in a way that suggests it is intentionally asking the reader to do all of the work. It just, like, doesn't seem to realize what it is implying. I wanted to to drop in real quick some of my other um, thoughts that I had on that since we're talking about it. Um, so I tried to break down the life cycle of humans in this world. I don't know that I, I gave it a complete breakdown. I don't know that you could with the information that we have, but I still want to talk about the gods mm -hmm. because each of the gods seems to have one or two unique superpowers. Like there's shape-shifting, there's illusion magic, there's flying. Sure. And then there's angels who are like servants to the gods, and the angels can fly, which is something that some of the gods cannot do. And the angels assume human form until they reveal their wings, right? Yes. But both gods and angels have genetics, as revealed by the fact that the god city of Florin or whatever can't be entered if you don't have Florentine genetics. Yeah. So they have like blood and stuff. L figuratively and literally. Yeah, and they can be killed with like guns because of the M16 or whatever the gun was that was used in the fight. Yeah. And it's unclear what happens when a god dies, but they can be killed because we know that a bunch of angels were killed. And you can be a fallen angel because there was a fallen angel in the Shadowlands, but he wasn't dead. He was like a traitor of the Ir Irusian army or whatever. Sure. So what does this all build to? Well, I think it's just something you see a lot in amateur fantasy where a lot of these magical things exist kind of for their own sake. I, I guess spectacle. It feels like... Lauren M. Davis had a bunch of like action figures lying mm. around and like some of them are a lot of like gods. Yep. Some of them are dinosaurs. Some of them are zombies. She has like a castle play set and she has like a French village play set and she has like an antebellum manor play set and she's just you know, taking the weapons out of the various characters' hands, swapping them around, putting them in different rooms in these different little play sets and acting out these scenes. I don't know how else to explain the like constant change of a venue with absolutely no meaningful distinction between them other than aesthetics okay wait let's dwell on that for a second because i think that might be more literal than you realize like i i mean i wrote fantasy stories about my guinea pig and all my toys hanging out with each other the only difference is i never tried to publish it and I unlearned a lot of my intrinsic biases before I wrote anything seriously. <laughs> Do you think that there is a chance that this is actually like, I don't, I don't even want to say it because it sounds so dumb, but like, it does feel somewhat plausible that like these are discreet like toys almost. I think this is her childhood, like, baby novel. Oh, I see what you're saying. This is, like, her first novel that's cobbled together out of every writing idea that she had up to this point. Yes. And she didn't know how to prioritize and cut stuff that yes, didn't fit. I, I, because it all means so much to her. Maybe the Vincent action figure was her favorite one that her Uncle Thomas gave her. And mm -hmm. and the the dinosaurs were something that her brother left for her after he went to college. Like, yeah. Oh, my God. I, I, I never thought about it until you mentioned it just now. Um, I think that's a very interesting way to view the story. Yeah. And like there's like little episodic like morality tales, like when she interprets King Lentil Death's <laughs> a dream or whatever that feels like reminiscent of like a Bible story. Like oh, it yeah. feels very Daniel in the lion's den. Oh, yeah. Definitely. So it's like maybe she had a short story that she was working on at some point that was inspired by that. It somehow got folded into this. Yeah. I think that would explain why it feels like almost contained right as far as good things go i don't think this counts but i know you didn't use ai too much because most language learning models won't let you use the r slur mm. so well there you go <laughs> for what it's worth i also checked a couple passages against a couple ai checkers and they all came up saying it was human i mean honestly i was a little bit surprised by that oh Miss Nodley is taking her meal in the dining room this morning, Elizabeth informed Avril. Miss Fairchild came to call early, so they are breakfasting together. Avril nodded her understanding and went about her other duties. Feeling the book she had finished last night in her pocket, she slipped into the Nodley's library to return it to its shelf. Priscilla hardly came in here, and if she did, it was most certainly not to read. Besides Mr. Nodley, Avril was positive she was the only company the books ever encountered. 
She slid the book from her pocket and crept over to the neat row of volumes. Stealing from your employer? Whispered a sullen voice behind her. You ought to be spanked. (laughs) God, that's so scary. (laughs) The weird thing is, like, that's probably one of the few, like, out-of-pocket quotes that's not anachronistic. By her own admission, she did not like the output of, like, grok ai that she tried to use yeah that doesn't surprise me given the ai art on the cover that isn't even properly sized to fit on the whole cover it's so scary did you notice the teeth are like the same texture as her giant eyelashes yeah and and that the teeth like almost look like they're part of her lower lip yes and that her phone isn't really a phone you can't tell what way it's facing it's so scary it's so scary the way the title is laid out, it's not aligned with the subtitle. Oh yeah, you can't read it. And you also can't read it because it's the same color as her hair. And then the title on the spine, which has a different subtitle than the, the subtitle on the front, is also not really properly aligned. It's it's a mess. Speaking of artificial, uh, this one is unfair and it's very rich coming from me. If anyone knows me personally, I have an awful taste in music. Um, Nova's playlist, like Nova's actual playlist is ass i listened to it like i gave it a college try before each chapter i would listen to the song it is like the most soulless Mm. artificial non-sequitur collection of soundtracks and like radio edits to covers of songs it's ridiculous yeah it did affect my reading experience it colored my interpretation i i viewed all of this in such a less favorable lens because and I'm sorry, this is not genuine criticism. Uh, don't take this seriously, Lauren. Like, the playlist sucks. It just, it just does. <laughs> it's really bad. It's so inconsistent. And like you said, some of the songs are like random songs from soundtracks that don't sound good in isolation. They probably serve their purpose in the soundtrack just fine. But accompanying this random chapter of a self-pubbed book, right. they they will not do. And again, I I wonder if this is even legal to do. I because it's so gray when you start dealing with like song titles and song lyrics. It's just interesting to me. I think you're being a little unfair to yourself. I mean, I don't know that it is unfair to criticize the playlist when the book is all but directly asking you, the reader, to listen to the playlist as you read the book. I mean, maybe it's unfair to say the playlist is ass. I think a better (laughs) question is, does it serve the purpose of accompanying the chapters? And the answer is still no. It does not. (laughs) No, one of them is literally like the Halo theme. I mean, everyone likes the Halo theme song, but like in context of a playlist and this narrative, I did not like a single song. I, I completely agree. I just wanted to make it clear that like, here at the English Club podcast, we're not like fundamentally opposed to like multimedia no, no. Uh, ideas or tie ins because I think that, like, in a world where like, everything is digital, it makes sense to expand literature into this frontier of like multimedia possibilities. I think it's potentially exciting. But that said, I think this novel is not successfully expanding the frontiers of what literature can do no. and how it can interact with other mediums. No, absolutely not. So I'd like to dive into the name weirdness for a second, because I don't know whether it's pointed. And this is kind of the problem with dealing with the work in a series is at any of these, Lauren could just say, oh, well, this is intentional. In book three, it will be revealed that they're the same person. But there's a lot of different names that manifest in a lot of different ways. We'll start with like different characters that have very, very similar names. There is a Diana Cade, who is like the Scytherian noblewoman that Avril works for. And then there is Cade Fletcher from the Lydia arc. These characters do not seem to be related. Again, Cade Fletcher is not the cowboy that is Kevin Fletcher. Cade Fletcher is a random character only encountered through phone in the Lydia arc. There are two characters. One is named Forsyth and the other for death. Uh, I don't know if you can tell from me reading it, but they differ from each other by one letter. Those don't seem to be the same character. Maybe they are. It's not inconceivable, but it's never explicitly made clear. It's really weird. Uh, and I, I don't know if that's laziness or or what. And on top of all that weirdness, there are so many names. There's so many characters. And many of the names don't really match the, like, aesthetic of the world that they're in. This, for me, was really noticeable in, like, the first bit in France, 
where so many of the names sound like British fantasy names. Yes. I don't know if you had that same impression, but they sound really, really English. Uh, I'm a pretty big etymology nerd. I'm not super educated on it, but I can tell you that no 1700s French nobleman, no matter how rural, would be named Chipper. I, I thought that one was kind of crazy. Right. And they would they would not call him Chip. No. It's crazy to me that they did that. Uh, Brett Louisette, I, I had commented on as being a very stupid name. Louisette is also kind of stupid because some, so he's like Louisette of Versailles. I, I talked about the quote unquote Arabian named uh, William. Right. What's their uncle's name again? His name is pretty British too. The Oh, Thomas Quint. Yeah. Uber British. Yeah. That's like a comedy British uncle name. Which is what he is, to be fair, except French. Right. I don't want to give the fantasy names a pass. Some readers would. A, a million people don't have a problem with the names in Fourth Wing, and I talked about how little I like those. But those were also weird. They did not come from a unified etymology or country of origin. Rebecca and Vincent are siblings from the same father, and I think the same mother even, but have different last names. Oh, right. Rebecca's last name isn't Chevalier, is it? Yeah, no, it's Rebecca Fairchild. And I don't remember Fairchild being a god name otherwise, so it might be a moniker. I don't know. (sighs) Who knows? It kind of goes back to the Japanese thing. Like, not a lot of thought is given to where words come from and what it means for words to come from a certain place. It made the world building very flimsy. No, Lauren, I do not believe that the fact this is a video game makes this okay. Especially because it's not a video game. It's like a archive of real events. <laughs> it's like a, right. a way to re-experience the actual past. It's real life. And then there are other names that are just like stupid, like uh, Mortis Capers, which we have talked about ad nauseum to this point. I will never forget Dead Lentils. <laughs> There's no way we could talk about this in an interesting way in an audio-focused podcast, but the technical issues are insane. We mentioned this a million times. Paragraphs drag on and on and on, and there is no sense of like weight to individual sentences. I might be stealing this point from Jay because they could probably define this better than I can. Uh, There is a certain rhythm, even to prose, where tense sentences are fast when action happens, it's just a couple sentences. Uh, or when you're taking in a beautiful landscape, there's long, long sentences. Or when a new speaker enters the scene, you hit enter so they can say their line and that gets defined. None of that is here. And I didn't realize how much I take for granted, not even from good writing, but from well-formatted writing. Mm-hmm. Spelling issues, grammar issues. It's kind of like with the Onision books. It's a self-published book. You can't be too hard on it, but it, it was bad. It was really, really bad. It's the kind of thing that not just like a beta reader, but like a well-trusted set of beta readers would have been able to catch. Like someone who knows this person knows their goals and knows how best to communicate to this person like, hey, you need to fix these these prevailing issues. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that like really only a friend can say to you. Yes. Because coming from anybody else, it's likely to seem... Like, they just don't get it, or like, they don't know you. But yeah, you need you need somebody that can read these things and be like, hey, you're, you're not introducing characters effectively. Mm-hmm. I get lost every single time. It's a pattern. <laughs> you need like a you need like a, the literature equivalent of an intervention. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, my God. Uh, you definitely do. The worst offenders for this is probably the way that Lauren, you try to render human speech. We mentioned the vampire thing. It kind of came and went in the beginning. Uh, Someone's joking around and say, V, the thirst, the for, the your, the blood. Which I get what Lauren is trying to do here. It's supposed to be like a stereotypical Dracula Transylvanian accent. But that's not how it works, even stereotypically. She literally just appended a V to every single word. I don't know why she did that. There was another part, it really got me, and I'll write an article for our website that really dives into this, but um, Avril tends to stutter, (laughs) and this is never rendered in a phonetically cohesive way. There's this one part that's not in our dramatic readings. Uh, At the very beginning, uh, they threaten to dock Avril's wages in France, and she says, no, 
no, no, no, no, no, no, no. So I guess this is stuttering, but I, I can't empirically tell you that because that's not how you render stuttering. It's not like in dash in o for no, you know, like it's no, 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 no. It sounds like um a bad text to speech. It's exactly what I was thinking. It sounds like some like a text to speech was trying to read stuttering. I think what it's supposed to be is like no, 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 no. Like I think she's like being like sassy. I guess, but that's still not apparent. I think you mean no, 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 no. I can believe. <laughs> I can believe that that's what you were trying to do, Lauren, but that is not how you do it. Indeed not. Lauren, it is not a bad thing to be Southern. The bad thing is assuming that everyone else on the planet is Southern. This got to me the most in the France arc where um, they're on the boat. It's the 1700s. They are in this wooden naval vessel and they eat honey glazed ham boiled sweet potatoes turnip greens with hot sauce and buttered cornbread now jay i'm not a cultural anthropologist but would you guess 1700s france no i would say my native u.s american south right right my (laughs) native u.s american south as well jay it manifested itself in little things like britches and then like Someone set a T-Rex on her tail, tail used colloquially here. Very little things that imply a lack of theory of mind. And I think this has snowballed into the ridiculous, insensitive little comments they make every now and then. And some of them just seem not as insidious as others, but at taken as a whole... It really makes me concerned for for Lauren, your broader cultural awareness or sensitivities. That doesn't excuse it, of course, no, especially not no. in a published work that is uh, is a citizen of the literary community, as Holly might say. That's Holly the person, not Holly the husky. The talk. I get the impression that, Lauren, maybe you're a little bit embarrassed or have been shamed in the past due to your U.S. American South as Miss South Carolina would say, uh, heritage, because it seems like on your Twitter feed, it's something that you've had to defend in the past or have felt that you've been under attack for. And I get that. I, I do. As a writer from the South, I am not a stranger to being treated with a certain amount of um, classist flavored criticisms of like my education um, and my writing and other Southern writers' education and writing. So that is certainly out there, uh, that prejudice against the U.S. South, but that also doesn't excuse doing harm to other marginalized communities. Absolutely not. That's just another reason I would encourage getting more people to read this before it makes its way out into the world. Bottom line is don't publish a book that has blatant racism in it. Yes. And um, if you're asking yourself, Lauren, well, how do I know what's racist? Make some friends and ask them to read your book. I promise it is not that crazy of a proposition, and a lot of people would be happy to do it. I mean, all of the writers from marginalized communities that I've ever worked with have been more than happy to point out when writing in workshops that I've been in with them have contained work that is unwittingly harmful. Sure. Um, And they almost always do so kindly. So it it can be uncomfortable to be told by somebody that your work is not just offensive, but actually harmful to them in their community. But like, if they're your friend, or at least your acquaintance, they want to see you get better and you want to see them get better. Sure. But I know we are preaching to a choir that has probably already left the building (laughs) based on how you've doubled down on Twitter about your beliefs about certain groups of people. But we have to critique this book as we see it. And in good conscience, we have to call this out. It is absolutely a very pressing uh, lack in this book. Yeah, I mean, it's something we do in in good faith, not just for the sake of Lauren M. Davis, but also for our audience who are writers themselves and also probably want to be made aware of the ways that their work can not do harm. And I would also say that we would welcome that same kind of feedback ourselves in our own writing. Absolutely. So this is not like a, a woke scold moment. We we are just trying to make the literary community a, a safer and more welcoming place. You are looking at the master of illusion. 
Fletcher bowed halfway and waved a hand to the side. I merely let them see me as you. The Florentine grinned. Hmm, said Vincent. Okay. Walking to the pool of anodyne, he removed his boots and socks, rolled up his shirt sleeves and pants, then slipped into the water. Seeing where the masked lord had bitten into Avril's forearm to drink her blood, he swiftly healed the area. What are you doing? Fletcher asked, arching an eyebrow. Bringing her back, Vincent answered. He lifted Avril into his arms and bent his head down. Can't you just touch her to do that? Fletcher's tone was agitated. You're going to kiss her, aren't you? I can't believe I saved your life so you can turn around and kiss the girl I like. Get over it, Vincent said firmly, never taking his eyes off Avril's face. Okay, so we've talked about how this seems like action figures a little bit. Yeah. And we've also talked a little bit how this seems like Kafka. Yes. And I kind of want to marry those two ideas and talk about how there's something like very, not childish, but childlike happening on the level of the structure of the book. Okay. There's two main places I see this manifesting. I actually noticed it as you were summarizing various little episodes that your your cadence and your momentum, not just of delivery, but also of sentence would kind of pick up and it would become this and then and then and then and then yes. sort of feel as you were talking that feels like a little kid telling a story. <laughs> That might be my my failure, to be fair, but... No, 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 because it's something that I was thinking as I was reading the book, and then you told it again that way, and I was like, this is intrinsic to the structure of the story. And I think the reason this is happening is because this book has this issue where it constantly introduces and then immediately resolves a conflict. Yes. Then realizes it needs to have a new conflict to keep the narrative going, so immediately introduces something totally new, which will often come with a change of setting, and then the cycle will repeat itself. Does that make sense, or am I imagining that? No, it absolutely makes sense, and I think it kind of goes back to all of the villains get killed off-screen. Yeah. If we're being charitable, there are three villains who die off-screen. Why not make it one villain who we learn things about and Avril has a relationship to? Especially because two of them already like to suck blood. Right. So like they're basically the same guy. <laughs> Very easy to merge. Yes. I also see this in whenever she ends up in a new place, she's immediately like, I have to get a job. And then someone will give her a job or she will get a job. Yes. And then the job will cause a problem. And then that problem will be immediately solved by meeting somebody else. In the Civil War arc, it's that nurse. Yes. And then, like, there's a battle, but then she's saved from the battle, and so on, and so on, and so on. And it's just, like, sometimes these things are, like, pages apart, uh, the introduction and the resolution of the conflict, I mean. We could talk for hours about how Avril will just get herself into a situation that she does not want to be in, or does not need to be in, shouldn't be in, even— and just considers that the rest of her life she now. She accepts it like she, so fast. She was sent directly to save this Atlantean woman and then refused to leave her life as a cop when Cirrus came to go get her. Like, why? She, she had already been like a baby. This is, the, this is the stakes of the story now. Right. As, okay, so the other place I see this like childish structure pattern happening is in the, the bizarre way that events will escalate this is sort of like the opposite of the way that she'll just accept whatever the new status quo is immediately one example of this like super bizarre escalation that i found was so in lord fortis um when he's a reindeer and then he reveals that he's been at animals the whole book um this conversation starts out as like this this almost kind of interesting like tension where they both like want to exchange something like he's got her soul and then like she wants to like fight him but she doesn't know exactly what he knows right there's like there's like some level of like adult power maneuvering happening yeah and then like within a couple of paragraphs the conversation has escalated to the point where Fortis is like, I've rigged your soul to explode. <laughs> and she's screaming in all caps, like, you're lying, you're lying. It's like ch childish, like the way that the like there's like emotional dysregulation in the characters that makes them seem like kids. Yes. Um, which, again, I think makes them feel like toys. No, no, it, it definitely feels like Avril is a child. Uh, it, it feels like a child wrote this, and I know that's a common insult, but I mean it very, very literally. Things just happen. Yeah, things just happen, and then Avril will either accept them or, like, 
have a meltdown, which like having a meltdown is not an unfair reaction to have no. in any of these situations. They're all extremely difficult to fathom. They would be impossible to process in the time that she's given to do so. But like the the switch flipping between like I'm okay and I'm having a, a panic attack or a meltdown feels like a, a two year old. We can't wave this away by saying, oh, there's just some some kid intern piloting this AI. And we know that it really happened this way because the implication from the other interns losing the game by making the wrong choices is that if you mess up enough, you'll be booted out. Right. You'll actually die in the game and like have to start over. Which we can talk about how that's a horrible way to design a game in 2023, but yeah. <laughs> I don't really want to talk about like, oh, this is a bad video game. That feels a little too cinema sense. Right. I mean, we could just kind of leave it as this is a bad video game. I wouldn't want to play this. I don't have anything intelligent to say about it. I don't like anything in the Lydia arc. Uh, the superheroes are stupid. The The boy drama doesn't make any sense. The fact that she makes out with a superhero does not make any sense. Uh, all of it is... I'm sorry, Lauren, I'm getting kind of animated. I was going to say irredeemable, but I, I really do not believe that anything is irredeemable. But it is all so incongruous with the rest of the story and so late to be delivered. Yeah. And I know I know. I said the prologue is what you want if you're going to do a story like this, but I don't think it's enough. No, no, not at all. We need uh, Lydia in and out of the game at the very least. So that we remember that she's there. But I think that would even detract from the narrative. No, no, we need her in and out in a way that, like, her story parallels Avril's or something. There's some sort of, if not actual interaction between the two, then thematic interaction between the two to keep the momentum up. That is the right answer, but I think that uh, that would balloon the story and make it stupid. Or I mean, this thing has to be completely overhauled anyway, so we might as well overhaul it in a way that sounds nice. Right? <laughs> Give it a shot. All right, you know what? Yeah, add that to the list of things to attempt. I mean, if we're treating this as like a quilt of various novel ideas and, and short stories that Davis has had over the years, then there's only a couple of options. I mean, I don't know if there's a way to really pick this quilt back apart into its uh disparate square pieces yeah i think the the move now is to just start jettisoning things that don't work yeah. until you get to like some kind of core unified aesthetic at the very least like pick a fantasy aesthetic and then move forward from there going back to the beginning talk about uh retooling easy easy suggestion make priscilla a little bit meaner if we're calling this from cinders to tiara and we shouldn't but if we do <laughs> we um, shouldn't <laughs> we shouldn't because that is a stupid title we um, mustn't <laughs> we must we literally mustn't that is it's really bad it, it, it's cacophonous on the ears no wait it's trochaic it's 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 not cacophonous it's in a meter okay i do I don't care, Jay. I still don't like it. It's it's discordant. <laughs> Her name is Priscilla Notley. Like it exudes mean girl energy, but we really don't see it from her. It would just be an easy way to keep things interesting in the beginning. It's not a big suggestion or very hard, but worth worth a shot. Yeah, she could at least be like a Dudley Dursley type. Yes. Yes, Dudley Dursley type. Dudley Dursley is inconsequential to Harry Potter. Other than like that one bit in like, I don't know, I think it's like the fifth one where Harry saves his life uh -huh. and people still remember him. You can have an inconsequential character that's still memorable. And I, yeah, I think making her like an evil stepsister is basically the best way to do that. Sure. And make her funny, but don't make her funny by making her fat because that's that's fat phobic. So don't do that. But but you can make her funny borrowing from the concept of Dudley. Yeah. So, Lauren, this is kind of a serious subject, but I was really concerned with Avril's drinking in the story. Avril doesn't drink a lot, but when she does drink, it is to excess every single time. Uh, it was especially bad in the Wild West arc, where she is with a group of cowboys that she does not like, does not trust, but still gets so drunk with them that she has a hangover the next day. And then later on, Vincent walks in on her trying to chug champagne and he just kind of hand waves it as your stress 
coping mechanism or, or something like that where it explicitly was something that she did to cope with stress and she does it with him earlier in a drinking game which i know had an ulterior motive but she also mentioned it was to calm her nerves so that she could talk to vincent I don't like the implications of this. I don't like how this is not acknowledged as possibly a problem in Avril. Um, And I don't think that that is a good message to send in your silly middle grade fantasy story. Yeah, I think it's key, like you said, not just that it's to excess every single time, but it's always a coping mechanism too, and that the novel doesn't acknowledge it. it. It's like a little weird. And it's not the only time that the novel, like, introduces something like that and then just drops it yeah. and it doesn't really guide the reader enough i would say about how we are supposed to be interpreting these things i think the other one is the one we mentioned in the summary where lydia is with her parents and mentions that she's having like hallucinations like actual hallucinations like potentially symptom of a severe condition hallucinations and her parents like make a kind of jokey remark about her needing to be medicated and then she kind of jokily waves it off and then it's never addressed again literally never it makes me wonder if lydia is a reliable narrator if she's supposed to be a reliable narrator and then like what lydia's mental state in relation to her reliability as a narrator says about like mental health Mm -hmm. like i guess what i'm trying to say is it's very thorny and i don't understand what including it adds to the story it seems like a distraction and a detraction for that reason. So I would think about sanding some of that down or omitting it completely. Yeah. Ideally. It would be free to delete it. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. It would actually save money to delete it. Yeah, it you would. could print print less, less paper, less ink. That's money in Avril's pocket. And then she won't have to scrub floors. <laughs> In her god salary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, she can throw those in her god money chest. <laughs> Well, Andrew, I feel like we would be remiss if we didn't talk about this book's parallels to other works previously reviewed here at St. Balasar University. Um, I know you want to talk about Empress Teresa and maybe even Handbook for Mortals a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk about Rin, Tongue, and Dorner. I was actually really interested in how you're going to bring Rich Shapiro. I know you asked him specifically to be in this meeting. I, I didn't see it, so I'm curious. I did. And and to his credit, he has been here. He's continued to stare sort of into the middle distance the entire time. His eyes appear to be uh, smoldering with some kind of, I would say it's a, it's a flame, maybe a meager flame. No, it's more <laughs> than meager. And... Uh, Let's talk about his book real quick. So I think that this book is actually a more effective psychedelic experience than Rin, Tongue, and Dorner. (laughs) Sorry, I said it. I know that's going to be controversial. Please don't cancel me in the marketplace of ideas. Here's the thing. Rin, Tongue, and Dorner, I think, relies too heavily on descriptions of bizarre geographies and random capitalized nouns to be trippy. I think looking back, I was tripped out by it, but only because I was overwhelmed by Rich being like, the gelatinous earth rippled with the vacuous might of the <laughs> void of the god god sun. Right. And having read Nova's playlist from Cinders to Tiara, Princesses of Earth number one, I think that the true trippiness or the true potential of a book to be trippy is actually in the structure and not so much in the content. It's in the way that you've talked about characters will randomly appear in a scene, also in the way that characters will randomly drop out of the story altogether, only to reappear 15 chapters later, as if we are going to remember who they are. (laughs) It's the lack of any environmental description which lends the world this sense of absence, like as if the physical realm is not quite present. Right. It's... Avril's inconsistent reactions to moments of peril, as we've talked about. It's the blending of genres between murder mystery and pulp fantasy, uh, cowboy thriller. It's it, it never lets you feel like you're on stable ground. And I think that makes it feel extremely psychedelic. There's another thing, too, that I think makes it feel that way. And that's the, the constant sense of paranoia that pervades the whole thing. I don't know if, if you picked up on that as well i got it in the nunez arc where he was like appearing to her as a ghost but other than that i didn't really yeah it's definitely there the other places i saw it were sort of in this idea on the whole that like there's this secret world operating in the shadows and it seems like there's always a more secret world Mm. so for instance we start out in france seems normal then we find out there's like secret countries that 
uh, Avril doesn't know about. Then we get to those countries and we find out that within those countries, there's like a secret war and like conspiracies happening that she never quite comes to grip with. Then there's like people that she trusts who are shapeshifters. There's animals around her that turn out to be shapeshifters. There's Avril being stalked by various characters at various times. There's Lydia being betrayed in the real world. And then there's finally, in the last chapter, Nova being stalked for, like, the entirety of the thing. So it always feels like the the main character is, like, being pursued. And not in the way that novels usually do. Like, obviously, there needs to be threat and conflict right. for these things to be interesting. But it feels like there is literally someone following these characters at all times. They can never rest. Because if they ever stop for a single second... God will teleport into their room via fairy door necklace and take them to a new continent and century <laughs> in which they will have to be a floor scrubber for a new dignitary <laughs> that they have never heard of before. <laughs> I never thought about it like that, but I think you're right. <laughs> it's terrifying. This world is really scary. No, it is. You, are, it is. you can never rest. You have to be vigilant. There's always a more secret world. Like, it is downright conspiratorial the the level like the 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 structure of the world building it really colors the twitter it's really bringing a lot of things together with you telling me this but i don't want to get into it quite yet it's unstable like the world building itself is unstable it's telling it, it is telling of a larger world view we were talking about things that kind of exist for their own sake without any ultimate narrative purpose this narrative purpose is um deeply concerning it makes but me extant, wonder what the intention so. is. Like, if the goal is just to tell a story, and then these things are part of Lauren M. Davis's worldview that just got inadvertently baked in, or if she really wants to tell us a story about a secret war of angels and demons happening behind the scenes, and that even within that secret war, there are more secret wars playing out on the interpersonal level. Yeah. There, there's a scene where a, a pastor sits us, the reader, down in a church and is like, trust no one <laughs> yeah like, there are other gods out there yes and that's one of the few scenes i feel like that stops the pace of the novel and to stop us there to give us this information i don't know what that means i mean i think i do know what that yeah. means but i mean read i don't know that it's a good thing a fun game to play with yourself is read each sentence of this book one by one and ask yourself did lauren take something very very weird for granted and not even realize it mm. because the alternative is this is intentional and this has some sort of agenda i don't know what's scarier but it's definitely more harrowing the agenda or the not realizing it's weird while writing it down the the agenda that talk about paranoia that implies a level of orchestration mm. that i think that we are not currently seeing we're getting into uh, the conspiracy territory if we have three levels of fiction that assert the same thing then we can only assume that this goes up yet another level to our world. Exactly. <laughs> For the sacred number of music, <laughs> that we are the fourth layer. It all makes sense. It's like it an Evangelion. It is the fourth one. I, I hope nothing is like Evangelion. <laughs> <laughs> On this, we agree. Small thing, not interesting, but it was really weird. Cirrus, the Liam from Fourth Wing character, disappears like 60% into the book and by my control F on Kindle never comes back meaningfully. I don't know why this happened. I didn't notice it while I was reading because I got him confused with Fletcher a bunch, but um, that should probably be addressed somehow. Oh, he like fully just vanishes. I didn't realize that either. Um, So Cirrus is last meaningfully mentioned on page 249 there are 376 pages. He does reappear in like the wedding because every other freaking character is in that wedding, but he doesn't meaningfully do anything. And the fact that this was like a traveling companion of Avril's is never touched on. I just thought it was weird. I don't have anything like sweeping to say about it. For me, okay, so when you said that, I was like, oh, well, he was a major character. He should have had like an actual arc resolution. But then what I realized is he doesn't have an arc. He's just there the whole time, which makes me think he should have had an arc. <laughs> well, his arc was making out with all the women on Earth. And once Avril stopped meeting women on Earth, his journey on the Earth was complete. Every time a woman is kissed, an angel angel gets its wings as the old saying goes that's why we should all kiss women am i right fellas <laughs> am i right am i right if you take nothing else from this episode get out there and kiss some babes don't be like us <laughs> making a podcast in the middle of the night 
Andrew, I don't think you're going to like this one because it's it's a little pedantic, but I have to I have to throw it in there just because I feel like these little things, especially when they're this early on, undercut your ethos as a writer. Mm -hmm. Uh, So on my page 11, Avril is what is she doing? She is putting together a breakfast tray in the kitchen at the Nautilus Manor. Mm -hmm. So what she's doing is she is just going and placing some breakfast on uh, Priscilla's bedside table, right? But we get this simile. As noiseless as a mouse stealing food in the presence of a house cat, Avril placed the hot breakfast on Priscilla's bedside table and struck up a fire in Miss Nautilus' fireplace. This is not how a simile works. So the fact that she's noiseless as a mouse stealing food in the presence of a house cat, like, when you compare a thing to another thing, it implies things about both things, right? Yeah. So, like, she's walking around noiselessly, sure, why not? It's early in the morning. But the fact that she's compared to a mouse stealing food in the presence of a house cat implies that there's danger. When you read a simile like that, the purpose of including the house cat bit there, it is to imply that there's a threat without having to directly state as the author that like what is happening in the narrative is dangerous. But in this case, there is no danger. She's just walking around quietly because it's early in the morning. And I feel like that's just a misunderstanding and misapplication of like a very basic writing rhetorical element. Yes. And like I said, this early in the book, it's a little bit harder to excuse. We're still getting to know Lauren M. Davis as an author, as well as getting to know Avril and this world. And to just throw that in there, especially like a kind of twee sounding simile like that. Yeah. (laughs) It fucks up the whole tone. It does. I just wanted to say that because it really got on my nerves it's one of those sonic high school similes where it just it creates more of a world than the author probably intended it to yeah you're right it like it stretches into like its own set of images that is like then you have to like transition back right. into like oh wait there is no house cat there is no mouse there's just avril in a room <laughs> with no threat right no that is interesting and i think that's just indicative of a lot of smaller technical issues that lauren m davis has as a writer i keep harping on about this today because as i'm getting ready to leave my mfa at the end of the semester i'm thinking about how important it has been to have a community of writers like at all times at hand to look at my work um sometimes under threat of getting a bad grade if they do not do so (laughs) Um, i'm thinking about like what a shame it'll be to not have that as easily i mean i'll still have people like i have writer friends who will read my stuff but we won't all be getting together in a room once or twice a week anymore and that's the kind of thing that probably everybody in the room would have caught and at least one person would have said something about absolutely um so yeah you should really talk to some more people lauren when when you're working on part two and not people on twitter because they don't have your best interest at heart no no god no i'm not saying you've necessarily played all your cards right in the social media department but i totally understand like having a strong reaction when strangers on the internet are suddenly insulting you like someone you don't know is getting all up in your face even virtually that can be very threatening sure but that said we all have to be adults um insofar as is possible (laughs) Lauren, when Petrarch was invoking the Gospel of Luke, he said, A repentant spirit is more joyful and esteemed than 99 others who were perfect. I say this to you to tell you to repent, apologize for being racist, and then forget about this story. Everything that we have suggested, bar very, very small changes, requires a significant retooling of this entire book and this is what people mean when they say kill your darlings the the house of cards that's being built here can't be modified or even touched without without falling apart that's a very hard pill to swallow and i i'm sure if you're listening to this you won't take this seriously you'll think that i'm another one of your twitter people saying that you're a horrible person and that you should never write again i'm i'm actually suggesting the opposite i think you should keep writing i think you should go crazy the biggest problems of this book come from things just happening and i consider that a symptom of you feeling pressure to constrain yourself to a normal narrative such as it were and i mean this in form of tropes there's a love triangle there's your dark uh sexy bad boy who you can't help but love there's a liam from fourth wing for god's sakes 
There's magic MacGuffins. I genuinely think you could take a page out of Norman Bhutan's book and write something of your own design with your own mind. Don't shield yourself behind cliches and tropes and structure. Just let it all out. And I make the suggestion to you for two reasons. Maybe three. The first being, this is a really hard book to edit. Uh, the first real one is... um. Most experienced readers, not even writers, readers, can smell experience in a writer. That's not even a quality thing, in my opinion. Um, it's like every word you write becomes this shadow behind you. Whether or not you write something good, people can tell that you've written a lot before. And I think what makes this obvious in your case is is kind of like in Handbook for Mortals, where there were these beats that felt like they would be part of a plot, but they ultimately didn't serve a broader narrative function. Your issues, Lauren, are more craft, but I think it's the same concept in Lanny's book, where there are a lot of things that kind of should have been there, but weren't quite delivered upon by virtue of experience. And just being able to fire from the hip, as it were, I think would get a lot out of your system, get a lot of this, what might literally be your childhood stories out of your system so that you can move on to something that is more wholly yours and more palatable to a reader. My second reason is kind of more selfish, and Jay might even think this is nefarious. I am so fascinated by the little glimpses of weirdness that we see in this book behind the weird fairy tale voice and the tropes and the japanese and the microaggressions deep inside of this somewhere lauren is a void and i want to go there you are at point i genuinely believe to become one of the most compelling outsider artists of our time I want you to be able to take that step and I want you to keep writing in a direction that you define that you don't feel pressured into. I don't know if any of that makes sense to you, Jay. I just feel very strongly. Damn, Andrew. I feel inspired. You breathed into me. <laughs> I, okay, I agree with several of those things and I want to piggyback off of the ones that most resonated with me. I'll start with the most recent one and work my way back. Sure. So, I also agree that there is a void at the center of this. I would maybe recharacterize void as fear or terror or something akin to ennui. It's evident in the the cyclical I must be able to meet my material needs, which like suggests like a deep lack of not just the the things themselves, but also like a sense of security. Mm. Um it's like this feeling of safety is never attainable. Um, and even when it is attained, is always one god teleport away <laughs> from being taken yeah. totally arbitrarily and with no ability to fight back. And I find that fear extremely compelling in concept. Sure. That said, this book cannot be the book in which that vision is realized. It cannot be. I, I don't like to be certain in this way much of the time because I find that it is not often helpful. But I am certain now this is not that book. This cannot be that book. This is, if not the childhood book. This is the hard drive first novel, by which I mean it lives on your hard drive and it's like the invisible foundation on which every novel hereafter is built. <laughs> every novelist has one of these, yeah. published or unpublished. Andrew, I know you have at least one, if not two of these. I have two of these books that various stages of them were critiqued by various groups of people and at times i was so sure that they were going to be the thing that like upended the ya fantasy yeah. or whatever market sure but like looking back i realized that no they are literally products of me learning about how to exist in that market and in that way like can never upend it or fascinate it in any meaningful way and that's okay and that is totally okay that is even good it's even maybe necessary and I can tell you, Lauren M. Davis, with some degree of additional certainty, that if you tried to edit this novel into something publishable, you would probably end up... I like Andrew's House of Cards analogy, because you can't start at the bottom and take out the bottom pieces, uh, because the whole thing would collapse. So what's going to be tempting to do is make surface-level line, paragraph, page edits. 
And when you realize that doesn't fix the problems, you'll go a little deeper and you'll think, okay, which scenes can go or be rewritten? And then that won't fix it either. And you'll go a little deeper and eventually you'll work your way all the way past the plot into the very world building and realize like, okay, this stuff cannot coexist. And once you realize that, you'll start making changes that will then ripple outwards and upwards up to the point where the entire thing just has to be rewritten because the world building is now incompatible with the book as it currently exists. You got a new book. You've got a new book. I've been through this, Andrew. I assume you've been through some permutation of this experience. Yes. It is inevitable. And this book, I suggest you bury it. I suggest you change your name. I suggest you move to a faraway place where no one knows who you are <laughs> and you start over with a new book and uh, get log off. <laughs> Log off, girl. Please log off. Actually, off of Twitter yesterday. Forget, forget the name change thing. Just log off and start publishing under a pen name. Yeah. And maybe, maybe then once you've explored that that void, will there be something that the world needs to see but doesn't get no needs to see? I, I wonder if we should have invited Ben Shapiro here. Mm. No, we should never have done that. Well, we never should have done that in the first place. But I, what I mean is you were talking about, oh, everything's one god teleport away from being taken from you. Everything was one president away from bringing the government onto your farm and taking all your stuff. And I know that, Lauren, you probably align more politically with Ben Shapiro than you would with us or even other authors in our club. That That might be a good avenue for you to pursue. Some political fiction. I mean, if it's of interest, if that's where the fear takes you into a sort of paranoid political thriller, I mean, I could definitely see that manifesting itself that way. I don't know that I would want to read that. But... Oh, God, no. But someone would. <laughs> someone would read it. Yeah. Give that a thought, Lauren. Uh, I think that would be fun for you. Uh, it would definitely help you channel that paranoia into something that might be a little bit more concrete and real than magic velociraptor gods. Yeah, for sure. Um, it would be a book without mermaids in it. <laughs> And that is a win on any front. <laughs> Just kidding. Not a mermaid hater. Not a fairy hater either. I know that people hated fairies for a while there because they were getting really popular, but I, I stand fairies. <laughs> and you can clip that all day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping that in. <laughs> oh, my God. You're not a demon. Avril stepped closer to him and peeked up into his face. If anything... It would make sense if you were the opposite. Saving souls is the work of angels. His eyes widened as he assessed her, but then his countenance re-darkened. Sense. He scoffed and leaned close. If you had any, you would do what's best and stay away from me. He moved away from her then, and with long, angry strides, he left the garden. I like how he plays hard to get, but then like actively approaches her every single time. <laughs> yeah. Stalks her and says, you need to stay away from me. He's really a man of two minds. Okay, so I hope that critique was helpful, but I do think that we can't have a serious conversation about this book without breaking one of our rules and incorporating the drama that brought this book into the spotlight. We have avoided this historically, and I will own the fact that we're kind of going back on something that we said that we wouldn't normally do. But I think that even if we are going against something that we have held almost to a maxim in the past, in this case, it's pertinent because this book's entire life has existed within the context of the Sungate right. discussion. And it would feel like an omission to not talk about it. If, if we were talking about this book like 10 years from now, I don't know if that would be the case. But because the only reason anybody's heard of this book is because of Lauren M. Davis's Twitter, mm -hmm. it would be silly not to talk about it. Yeah. And if you don't already know about us and you've somehow found this, uh, this is probably why you're here. So let's just jump right into it. We do want to go over hashtag Sungate, hashtag Lauren M. Davis drama, whatever stupid things it exists on i'm not on twitter i'm not on tiktok people on twitter and tiktok have told me about this thank you uh redheaded jay from the goosebumps video for bringing this book to my attention in the first place so i will walk you through the facts of sungate and we will talk a little bit about what this means and the effect that this has on our reading of the book 
Marv Michael Anson is an aspiring author who is shopping around her book. She's talking about her work in progress and she's tweeting about her main characters. One of them is a girl who has powers over the sun. I think like draws solar powers and can use her magic based off of her sun powers. And it's all part of this fantasy series that draws a lot from Anson's cultural background. She's doing all of this on her own, just kind of tweeting out. And then our our friend and fellow student, Lauren, responds to her on Twitter, asking if this girl with sun powers happens to be black. Anson says, yes, this is, this is a black girl with sun powers. Davis responds, Please open your DMs about the copyright infringement case that I am pursuing against you for this character. Implying... Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. So Lauren M. Davis initiated all this just from that? Yes. As as I understand it, according to my research into a social media platform that I don't like and don't like to be on, Marv Michael Anson is innocuously tweeting into the void just promoting her work in progress. She was just tweeting on her own. Lauren finds the tweet or follows her and responds to this. And that's what kicks all of this off. Okay, I didn't realize she initiated it quite like that. So I am not very well versed in copyright. Uh, However, I I have a lot of difficulty accepting that Lauren has a case here. Even if she did have a character who was black and had sun powers... It would not be the only character in the world who had sun powers, and it would not be the only black female character who had sun powers. It seemed very pointed and very bizarre that she took this aggressive stance against Anson, and they were probably on like some aspiring writer Discord server, which is how they knew each other, and that's how Lorraine asserts that Anson even knew that she had a character who was black and had sun powers. The best part of this, the best part of this, Jay, is that Nova, the alleged black female character with sun powers in Lauren's work, is not black. Indeed. And she does not have sun powers. I don't care what Lauren says. I don't care what she tweets. Yes, I have read Solar Sisters, which has nothing in common with this book except for a few names. Nova is explicitly white, and it's ridiculous that that this is what it's come to. But that is the situation. TLDR, Lauren asserts that she has copyright over Sun Powers, specifically a black female character with Sun Powers. As far as I can tell... And in good conscience, I I have to report, uh, Marv Michael Anson seemed to just be tweeting and Davis found her. I I, I cannot find anything implying that there was any significant pre-existing relationship. That's really strange. (laughs) I don't really know what to make of that, to be honest. Yeah. It's really weird. And any amount of goodwill I might have had towards Lauren in this situation is quickly expunged in light of a tweet she posted where she implied that the rate of crime in Nigeria is higher than other places, and this might be indicative of Anson's alleged theft her nefarious intent right and she along with this tweet lauren posts a google search result of um what type of crimes come out of nigeria that was another reason i i even wanted to talk about this controversy in a in a show where we generally leave this out is i think that is the same kind of insensitivity and ignorance that defines a lot of the problems in nova's playlist i'm not a copyright lawyer i have no idea what you can actually copyright or can't but that seems way too flimsy of an idea to say that you own or came up with right like that's that's too far it's so broad and especially because like the thing isn't even published yet like the part of the story where Nova is black and has sun powers. Right. Nothing about this is published yet. And people call her out on the ridiculousness of this accusation. And Lauren continuously asserts that this is about more than just sun powers. She says, and I quote, but that is what social media saw and ran with. 
it was about having all the same tropes and plot synopsis as my series, something I checked out before even sending her a DM. So this has been about another independent author making a large genre hop and suddenly adding romance to her story within the last four months. So, Jay, a fantasy story with romance, you know what that sounds like? Well, Andrew, I I reckon it sounds just about like every fucking fantasy book I've ever looked at. How is that verbatim the exact thing that I was going to say to you? (laughs) So yes, um, I think the term is sins affair. Um, You can't copyright certain things that are endemic to a genre, and I think tropes apply to this level, or at least I would rationally think they do. Listen, Lauren, I hate Twitter. I hate the mainstream media. I would love to sit here and tell the world that everyone got the story wrong and that Lauren M. Davis actually has a case. But you never elaborate on what is being infringed other than sun powers. Because you keep saying it's more than sun powers. Okay, Lauren, then what? Citation needed. (laughs) Citation needed, literally. You need to unilaterally and cogently state exactly what she did, allegedly, and the fact that you don't is extremely, extremely damning. Lanny, I I know we've talked to you in real life, and, like, whether or not someone believes your story about your controversy with uh, allegedly inflated sales numbers, you have a story. Yeah, a consistent story. A consistent story I mean, I don't I don't care whether or not someone actually believes it, but I believe that you believe it. I can't tell what Davis's intentions are here, and I, I cannot tell you that she's acting in good faith because she is not stating a narrative here. Yeah, if she's gonna say that more is being infringed upon, she needs to say what that more is. And it, if if it is tropes, like she said in that tweet, it should be fairly easy to make even a bulleted list of like, here's where this trope is copied, here's where this trope is copied, here's where this plot beat is copied. And the fact that she hasn't done that is very suspect. Right. And and even if she did, okay, let's say she did and she laid out, oh, it's a fantasy story. It has a a black main character. The character has sun powers. There's romance in it. If she laid all of that out, I still don't think that she has a a sound argument for legitimate copyright infringement. I mean, we learned this with Cassandra Clare's bullshit that she wrote a story with just a bunch of like vampires and demons. And then every asshole who wrote a story with vampires and demons started suing her because if you write a story about vampires and demons, you use the same tropes over and over. This makes me more mad than other controversies that we've had because of how obstinate you're being to an extent that it hurts your own narrative. Yeah, at some point it's like, lay out the case or stop talking about how you have a case. It feels like posturing. Right, right, right. And it it reeks of conspiracy, not to sound like you, but uh, (laughs) I wonder if um, you might have like a a marketing aspect to this uh this whole thing because i bought your book oh you think she's got an angle i spent money on you because of this controversy so i fell for it there was one tweet i saw that was like only two people have bought my book (laughs) yes and it was made like the day after both of us had bought our books i think she specifically said via amazon which is where i bought my book me too so me too Hmm. So uh, literally the day after I bought my, or you bought yours, because I think I bought mine first, she posted that. Yeah. I don't want to take credit for that because it's impossible to verify, but I absolutely want to take credit for that. I'm going to allege that, sort of, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to hypothetically allege that. I'm going to allege that I'm alleging that right. those are, that she's talking about our two copies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I mentioned, the question I keep asking myself is, Is there any reality in which Lauren was acting in good faith here? Oh, I mean, I think so. I think there can be. I just don't think it's this one. If she really had a case, I think she would have said it by now. I think she knows she doesn't have a case, but she wants just she can't back down now. It's like she's invested too much in this. But she also can't say anymore because if she says anymore, it'll be evident that she doesn't have anything to say. Right. (laughs) Let's steel man Lauren for a second for the sake of conversation. Sure. To be clear, I I think Lauren is just wrong, uh, was mad and tweeted something that now she can't take back and now won't back down from that stance. 
That is what I think. As do but I. But let's let's steel man this for a second and say that these are two writers, Lauren and Marv, in a writer's discord where they have maybe exchanged a passing conversation in some kind of bigger forum with lots of other writers. And it is not inconceivable that in that setting where some people are more active than others, one person who's sort of a lurker could, uh, I don't know, magpie other people's ideas sure. and then cobble that together into a story or even steal or borrow heavily from one particular vocal author in that Discord server. Sure. That is not inconceivable to me. But if that were the case, there would be like screenshotable bits of conversation where Lauren could be like, here's where I was talking about this plot detail publicly in the Discord. Right. And now look at how that compares to what Marv is describing in this scene. Like, it would be possible to do a comparison like that. And the fact that Lauren hasn't provided anything like that just makes me think that it doesn't exist. Right. Receipts, as it were. Yeah, where's the receipts? That's really interesting from a critique group perspective, because every amateur writer that I've ever met trying to convince them to join the Real Life English Club has cited something about having a fear of their ideas being stolen. It has gotten to the point where if you don't have that fear, I consider it a sign of experience or honestly even skill, and I know I'm not the only person who thinks that way. This whole controversy raises interesting opinions about the value of an idea. Writing groups can be pretty incestuous. They they can take a lot of things in, in good faith from other writers. I think that's a natural part of the process. To break another cardinal sin of the show, I mean, Jay, you and I both wrote a high fantasy story with Greek influences, and we did this independently, and neither of us threatened to sue the other. Mm. Well, not yet. Not yet, anyways. I'm I'm just going to say it's not, it's not not on the table. <laughs> well, it hasn't happened yet. It depends on how popular yours ends up being. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken ideas from other writers. I have had other ideas taken from me. This show is built on the idea of giving other writers ideas. It's like candy. You you barely even notice it. It's very bizarre to me the territorialness some writers have over something as easy to reproduce and cheap as an idea. I go back and forth on whether or not I think of ideas in general as easy to come by or as not that valuable. Um, I think it's different in poetry than it is in fiction, but I think we can definitely both agree that, like, the concept of a girl who has power to channel the sun is not so inherently staggering that it's, like, a precious gem. Right. Like, it's a cool idea, I guess, but it's, it's a little hollow in that state. It needs more surrounding context to make it really cool or just kind of eh. Or, yeah, just original. Yeah, it's, it just is, like, I'm thinking, say if a new writer came to, like, the actual real-world English club and didn't actually present a story, but was like, I'm working on this story about a girl that can channel the power of the sun, that would mean absolutely nothing to me until I actually read the story, because it's going to be, like, what you do with the idea, the execution, that determines whether or not it's a, it's a cool read or not. Yeah. So, so it's weird to me to be so defensive over such a broad and malleable concept let's let's reverse straw man ideas are the most sacred things in the world they are very very important to protect they are intrinsic to some specific person is lauren a hypocrite for using the most god-awful ai art possible for her cover i mean yeah unambiguously yes (laughs) i don't really know how to make the conversation interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess that's not really a good rhetorical question because this AI model was ostensibly filled with art whose artists did not consent to feed it to the machine. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't help that the art is horrendous. I like Empress Teresa's cover, but it's not very objectively good. Oh, it's a classic, though. It's a certified classic. Right. Uh, whereas this one is a little bit more forgettable. The issue with this one, I, I, well, there's many. There's all kinds of like errors that you could have paid somebody probably like 20 bucks to touch up, like even just smoothing over the uh, weird like marks on her cheeks. The frowny face. Something to smooth over like the weird like tooth lip, something to make the phone face the right way, something to make the headphones not be melting into her hair. Honestly, 
yeah, you could have paid someone twenty dollars to fix this. And the fact that it's like a square that doesn't actually fit on the cover properly <laughs> makes me think that this was generated in like crayon or some other like website you can just go to. Like it's not a program you really have to tinker around with at all. Um, and that this was just copy pasted onto yep. the uh, self pub um, formatting page. I've never self pub, so I don't know exactly how it works, but I would assume that you just like you know slot it into a default cover layout and upload it. It basically is what I'm saying is it looks like not a lot of thought went into this. And with that thoughtlessness came a theft of other people's art. Yeah. um, And I think that's the best way to put it. And again, to bring Twitter into this, uh, when confronted about this, Lauren will say AI art generates it ex nihilo using the sources as inspiration. It's like if a, uh, if a painter ponders all the great works of art before painting, Um, Whether or not this is literally true, again, this is hypocritical because reading a great work of art and then using some of its tropes in your story is the same core concept. If creation ex nihilo is what it takes to not be plagiarizing, then this book is plagiarism all the way through. If that's the standard, is like total new... Nothing isn't! You've set yourself up for failure. Maybe Empress Teresa. Maybe Empress Teresa. But that has British people in it, and unfortunately those do exist, Uh, so even that would be plagiarism. What, um, J.K. Rowling doesn't have a copyright on British people? Well, whether or not she has a copyright on them, I mean, they are real, that is irrefutable, as much as we would all wish it otherwise. (laughs) I think Twitter got it right on this one. I don't think... Marv Michael Anson did anything wrong. Nova is not black. The text says that Nova is not black. I I know I sound really weird emphasizing this, but it bothers me so much that that's what Lauren keeps falling on. Let's get the citation out. Let's get the MLA, the whole deal. Page 373, Nova's playlist from Cinders to Tiara, Princesses of Earth, Volume 1. Now, I knew that in every scary movie I had ever seen, the white girl who usually goes to investigate said noise ends up getting hacked up by the serial killer or chased to death. Uh, Blah, 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 blah. I opened the door and consequently felt like the stupid white girl I was. Well, there it is, folks. That's smoking gun. I I don't understand the the insistence. And I don't care what was on the document that you posted on your blog. This is a distraction, but I love the phrase chased to death as if like they reach their they reach their chase limit and they're like, I die now. Yes. <laughs> they run out of stamina and their <laughs> HP drops. To they zero. run out of um stamina. They respawn points. at the nearest grace. <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple other like weird little things about Lauren's bio that I wanted to talk about before we close out. Yeah. So she worked as a freelancer at this magazine called Scribe Magazine. Yes. And as someone that does freelance writing for pay, they are very, very weird publications. So if you go to their website, it looks kind of glitzy at first. It looks it looks nice. They mainly publish articles on like pop culture stuff. So like movies, books, TV. But they also publish short stories and poetry, but they call the short stories tales, which is weird and esoteric interesting another weird thing about them is that they don't pay so you you submit your story to them you have to query them and they they state multiple places that like they only want stuff that's of high quality so that their website continues to be of high quality for its readers which is not a thing that magazines usually say because it's like a given right they don't publish not quality because Why would you do that? Right. They pay in exposure. They also offer book promotion and social media management services for authors. But it's really, it's really weird, this website or this part of the website. I recommend like scrolling through and I think you'll get a better sense of it than when I describe it, but I'm going to try anyways. The language here seems like vague. It doesn't use enough like industry specific jargon for like writing and social media management to Mm. seem legit Mm -hmm. it kind of reads like it was written by somebody who doesn't like know the the space very well it just feels too broad in general interesting what i found out is that davis left scribe sometime in 2021 and the two articles she published there which were how to get your crush's phone number parts one and two have been taken down after another author she alleges tried to steal the articles and publish them elsewhere ain't that a pattern yeah so you can't find those articles on Scribe anymore. There is a link to them. Uh, I think it was on her blog, but it is gone. Like, it just doesn't work. So that's interesting. Seems like maybe there's a pattern there. 
I also found, this is a little thing, that she joined Twitter in 2020, which is also when the first post on her blog went live. So it seems like she really started her like writing presence in 2020. Mm-hmm. And we know that she wrote before that in college because she mentions writing for creative writing classes elsewhere. I don't even know if she had an English major. Yeah, I don't know. It seems like she pivoted really hard into writing in 2020. And then this is the culmination of that. Or this being Nova's playlist is the culmination of that. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we are not alleging any wrongdoing on the part of Scribe Inc. Yeah, yeah. I just, Scribe Magazine doesn't seem to be doing anything illegal or immoral. I just find it strange that they don't pay, but that there's nothing wrong with that, per se. If you choose as a writer to send your work to them and have it published on their site, that's totally fine. Her identity is very, very interesting to me, and I don't even know why. It's just become a pet project. I, I've heard that she might be a Kate Corain sock puppet. I do not believe that is true at all. Very fortuitous timing, but no. Um, she appears to be a real person and has had an internet presence long before the Kate Corain drama. But I, I have not found a lot about her online and normally with someone of this prolific tweeting proclivities you would think there'd be a lot more out there yeah i scrolled down to the very bottom of her twitter feed to see if there was anything interesting but it gets more boring the further down you go it seems like it really got interesting uh recently when the drama kicked off right so i I mean i know she's real but other than that i think that's all we need I wouldn't be surprised if if her and Kate Corain and Alex Astor were all heads on the same Hydra <laughs> being manipulated by the body that is Norman Bhutan working in the shadows. <laughs> sort of the, the archon of the ultimate bad internet fiction conspiracy. It's been crazy. Um, This has been the most time I've ever spent on Twitter in my life. I thank Jay every day for running that for me, so I don't have to think about it. But I I cannot be on your side on this. And if you ever want to, again, unilaterally and cogently, so clearly state your case in one single place, I'll listen, but for right now, I I really can't get behind you on this one. Yeah, I'm willing to hash this out in like a good faith venue. Um, Mm -hmm. Lauren, if you are listening, I know that we've been harsh to your book, but we have talked to authors in the past. You can listen to our conversation with Lanny Sarum to see how we talk to authors whose works we don't always even fully enjoy at, at every stage. So if you are interested in really like laying out your case for how your ideas were stolen and even talking about what's coming up next in the rest of the series and or how you would revise this book now that it's out, if you were to revise it, um, we would be happy to have you on. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, You are a member of the SBU English Club, whether you like it or not. So you're here forever now. Right. And anytime you think you're out, we'll pull you right back in. (laughs) Well... I think we've about exhausted the subject on this one. Um, Thank you for listening through our digressions. I know we don't normally talk about book drama, and this is not going to be a pattern, but I thought it was very appropriate here. We will continue our mission to be the most objective and constructive critique group in the internet. On the internet. I, I like in the internet. Okay, in the internet. I feel like it envelops us. <laughs> it does. I don't feel like we're on it. Like, I don't feel like we're standing no, we're on it. we're definitely immersed. Like, we're not meaningfully, like, atop it or skimming along its surface. Like, I feel like whether or not we want it to, like, it is surrounding yeah, us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's, that's great because it brings us all this wonderful content. Um, speaking of content, we hope you enjoyed. There's a lot more coming. If you like this episode, please be sure to like, subscribe, rate, follow, wherever you're listening or watching. Uh, it just means the world to us. It's not even about SEO at this point. Like we just love the community that this has created and we love being able to add our voices into the mix. If you want to connect with us between episodes, you can always follow me on Instagram at English Club Podcast, or you can follow Jay on Twitter at... You'll find it. Or find our website at EnglishClubPodcast.com. I'm going to work on an article talking about some stuff that I didn't get into the episode and Jay probably won't let me say on air. Small housekeeping note, uh, I'm kind of shouting into the void because I'm desperate. If anyone has a Kate Corain arc please DM me. No price is too great. 
Uh, I am so desperate for this book. Yeah, Nova's playlist was kind of a backup because we couldn't get our hands on, what is it called, Crown of Starlight? Yeah, yeah. If you have Crown of Starlight, let us know. We can arrange for something. Anyways, this has been really, really fun. But Lauren, I think this is the end of our night together. So thank you. Good night. It's already shaping up to be over twice the length of a usual episode. Andrew, it's looking like you've reached level 150 or so. You've hit the strength hard cap. You've hit the deck soft cap. You've maxed out your build. You've delivered this finger maiden to the end of her journey. I think it's time that we um, we hit that new game plus, which is to say close up for the evening. <laughs> And do it all again next week. Uh, one day you and I need to sit down and do a video on um, going through the Elden Ring lore and trying to identify which parts of it is um, George R. R. Martin's fault. I-, I think I've told you about this before. Like, I can, like, smell it having read Game of Thrones. Like, yeah. only George R. R. Martin would say something as stupid as Finger Maidens. And I've played, like, a lot of the Souls games at this point, right. so I feel like... I would be attuned to that stuff, but not the Game of Thrones stuff. So I think we would be able to put it together. The two of us put together, I think we could do it. Um, So yeah, we'll let you off the hook for now. We'll see you guys around campus, but uh, be sure to follow us for more. Thanks, guys. See you around campus. And uh, Rich, you can stop staring now. Four fighters wearing form-fitting, light blue spandex slid down from the dragon's back and raised their weapons. I didn't catch that they were wearing spandex the first time around. Where the fuck did that come from? (laughs) No, Right? One shot arrows at the snipers that flamed upon contact, her blonde hair giving Rebecca away. One other fired a pump-action shotgun and M16, Fletcher. The third had a wand that he used to enact offensive spells. Neil the Kindred. Who the hell is Neil the Kindred? While the fourth was armed to the teeth with semi-automatic pistols, Amy. 